As mayor, I call this meeting of Stanton City Council to order. I note that this meeting is being broadcast over the city's cable channel and streamlined on the city's website so that members of the public may hear our meeting. The meeting is also being recorded. I ask the clerk of council to call the roll for confirmation of those council members present for today's meeting. Mayor Oates. Here. Vice Mayor Robertson. Here. Ms. Dahl. Here. Mr. Holmes. Ms. Darby. Here. Ms. Mead. Here. Mr. Claffey. Here. I've confirmed council members are present. All right, thank you. I ask that city manager Steve Rosenberg note the participation of any city officials or colleagues or anyone else during today's meeting by Zoom or telephone. Madam Mayor, uh, participating on the Zoom platform are council members Dull and Mead, as well as library director Sarah Scrobus. All other uh, participating city employees are will, will be present in council chambers. All right, thank you. Please let me mention that notice reasonable under the circumstances of this meeting has been given to the public contemporaneously with the notice provided to members of city council. In addition to limited public seating in city hall, access to this meeting has been provided to the public by audio feed on the city's cable channel and the city's website. During this work session, as in the past, there will be no opportunity for public comment. Public comment will be received during council's regular meeting which will begin at 7.30 p.m. Instructions for public comment by telephone can be found on agenda for the regular meeting and on council's website at www.ci.stanton.va.us backslash government backslash city dash council. Also, let me highlight and have reflected in the meeting minutes that this meeting, although being conducted in person, is also being conducted by Zoom with virtual participation by certain members of city council given the catastrophic nature of the declared emergency and disaster related to the COVID-19 outbreak, which is part of the total circumstances makes it impractical or unsafe to assemble in a single location. The meeting is being held consistent with the City Council Ordinance 2004 regarding continuity of government, a copy of which can be found online at www.stanton.va.us backslash C O G O R D two zero two zero zero four. All right. The next item on the agenda is the consideration of work session and regular meeting agendas. Madam Mayor. Council Member Claffey. I move to amend the regular meeting agenda to add item E, which is a consideration of engagement of McGuire Woods. LLP related to city attorney search to the regular meeting as point E. Okay, we have a motion on the floor to add item E. Is there a uh, second? Second. All right, we have a second. Any further discussion? And hearing none. This, this, is, uh, this is Councilwoman Mead. Councilwoman Mead. Are we considering uh, hiring the entire firm of McGuire Woods as counsel for that purpose? They will be uh, the firm that will be representing us. Um, however, their attorney, their senior partner, uh, Craig Wood, would, is the consideration, potential consideration. Any further discussion? Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mayor Oates. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. The next item on the agenda is item number two, the Stanton Public Library Annual Report for 2019 through 2020. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Sarah Scrobus, the city's library director, will present this item. Madam Mayor, thank you for your time this evening, um, and thank you for allowing me to appear virtually on Zoom. Each year I present an annual update on the operations of Stanton Public Library. 
This past year, and I'm not the only one who feels this way, I'm sure, has been one of the hardest of my career. And compiling this report was initially challenging to do as I reflected on a year characterized by a public health emergency. But as I told the Library Advisory Board at their last meeting, putting together this report for you turned out to be a much needed and welcomed experience that allowed me to reflect on our staff members' hard work and achievements that took place during the bulk of the fiscal year prior to COVID. With the pandemic and our subsequent closure overshadowing much of the past year, compiling this information was a lovely reminder of the path we were on before our public closure in March. My update tonight will primarily focus on fiscal year 20, beginning July 2019 and running through June 2020. But since this has been such an unusual year, I'll also briefly touch on some updates that have occurred since we resumed limited services in these past few months. Before this meeting, I submitted a digital copy of this year's report to Council. That report can be accessed by members of the Stanton community either through the Council Agenda Packet or on the library's website at stantonlibrary.org. We also have paper copies available to be picked up at the library. I'll start by addressing the unfortunate main focal point of our year, how COVID had an impact on our operations. As the city shut down public operations in March, the library closed its doors to the public during the afternoon on Monday, March 16th. Our staff on duty that day immediately convened after closing the doors, and together we frantically put together a curbside pickup service model that we launched the next day. We also immediately began a quarantine procedure for all returned materials. It was the early days of the pandemic, and I personally was afraid that the library was a risk for being a vector ourselves by circulating shared touched materials and possibly endangering people by encouraging them to be out in public. That idea weighed on me very heavily, and after discussions with other libraries around the state about what they were doing, we made the difficult decision to end curbside pickup service a week later on March 24th. During our facility closure, we maintained somewhat regular staffing schedules and continued to serve this community by phone and online. Each day we worked intensively with patrons on the phone or by email to get them set up with online account access or to troubleshoot our digital collections. We also worked to, maintain, uh, to relax many of our policies to extend access as much as possible, making online registration more flexible, extending loan periods, waiving overdue fines, and our efforts on that front paid off. From March through June, our digital collections, which are, were the only 100% safe way to use the library at that time, saw an astounding 44% increase in use over the same period in 2019. During our final quarter, March through June of the year, we had 181 new users register for Overdrive, which is also known as Libby, um, alone. That was a 72% increase in new users over the previous quarter. Our staff seized every opportunity we could to continue to connect with the community. The Friends of the Library gave permission to loot their donations that they had amassed for the canceled April book sale so that our staff members could give away free reading materials to students at the school's meal distribution sites. We participated in that teddy bear scavenger hunt that residents informally created throughout the city, and we posted a slew of staff pics and videos highlighting online content to try to help people find something good to download. All the while, our staff used the facility closure as an opportunity to tackle projects that we could not normally do. We undertook what we think is our first inventory of the physical collections and scanned all 120,000 plus items individually to ensure that our online catalog accurately reflects our holdings. Only 0.3% of the collection, or roughly 400 items, were unaccounted for. So not bad for having never done a, an official inventory before. We also shelf read everything, shifted collections to better space them out, and dusted and cleaned all of the bookshelves. In April, our part-time staff members were involuntarily terminated due to the dire economic circumstances. But as the governor's phase reopening of the Commonwealth progressed, and we learned that the most frequent method of COVID transmission was person-to-person -person contact versus common services, we felt we were safe to resume curbside pickup and receive permission to begin rehiring part-time positions mid-June. Since that initial round of rehiring, um, we've been able to bring back most of the library's part-time positions to acquire and process new materials at the start of the fiscal year, to shelve the increasing number of returns, and now to staff the library's open hours while balancing curbside pickup services. As of now, and in part due to our limited public access um, schedule, we still have three frozen positions, one regular circulation assistant and two substitute circulation assistants. We're now open 38 hours per week, Monday through Saturday, and offer curbside pickup appointments Tuesday through Saturday. 
As I mentioned, COVID threw us off track in the spring and our closure had an unprecedented impact on our final statistics. The report includes an overview of statistics as they stand, which of course are significantly lower than the normal. Our circulation dropped 26% from the previous year and the number of library visits dropped 31%, which makes sense because we were closed for about a third of the year. Interestingly, not all of our statistics saw a decrease. The final number included on the cover page of the submitted report is that our program attendance is that of our program attendance, story times, genealogy workshops, computer classes, teen book clubs, etc. We actually had increased attendance over fiscal year 2019 due to what I believe are two main reasons. The first is that by mid-March, when we closed to the public, our teen program attendance for fiscal year 20 had already surpassed that of the entire fiscal year 2019. A successful partnership with uh, Greater Good Gaming had allowed us to continue to host incredibly popular teen gaming nights, which allow kids a shared experience and a chance to build community. And our library was the recipient of a grant from the American Library Association to fund a book club for underserved teens. We partnered with the schools for recruitment and facilitation of the club and to provide after school transportation to the library. The second factor in increased event attendance is that when we closed to the public, our, our youth services staff in particular made a switch to hosting story times online by posting videos to our Instagram account. Because you can view them without having an Instagram account and you can view them whenever is most convenient for you, it actually allowed more people to quote unquote, attend these programs. Rather than having to be at the library at 9.30 for story time, caregivers and their children can join Miss Martha and Miss Lizzie whenever it's most convenient for them now. Since March, Youth Services staff alone have posted 95 virtual programs that have garnered over 9,500 views. This was all new to us in March, but our staff jumped right in to continue to provide some sense of normalcy to our youngest and uh, regular library patrons. Now that we know more about the process, we're refining it, and we've been able to begin adding captions to our videos. They're not perfect, but we want to make sure that we're able to include members of our deaf and hard of hearing community if they would like to attend and share these stories with us. Because the COVID situation was so unique and because we were on track to close out another fantastic year, I wanted to also share how we were trending before closing to the public in March. Included in the report are projections of our statistics that show how the library might have ended the year had we not closed due to COVID. You can see we were on target with just about every co uh, category until COVID derailed us. A special mention this year is the Talking Book Center, which serves our local residents who are blind or print disabled. On the heels of being named the National Subregional Library of the Year last summer, the organization once again lived up to this honor. Because their patrons are primarily served through the mail, staff were able to safely continue to send out materials and did not shut down operations during the pandemic. Larger libraries shut down their talking book centers when their libraries closed, and in some areas of the state and country, disabled readers were unable to access reading materials for months. Our small but mighty talking book center persevered. Their circulation increased 11% over 2019 and is up more than 26% over two years ago in 2018. Patrons reported that Talking Book Center services were a lifeline during a period of isolation. Before COVID, the Talking Book Center staff and board members were also hard at work raising their profile in the community by participating in outreach and other events like Queen City Mischief and Magic, Senior Health Fairs, and White Cane Awareness Day. In non-COVID related library news, last summer the first floor project was finalized with the help of IT, Public Works, the Stanton Library Foundation, and the Friends of the Stanton Library. This was the first major facility project in years. For a brief period, we had a lovely brand new browsing and reading area along with some silent study and quiet reading spaces. We also opened up access to digitization equipment purchased with grant funding from the Community Foundation of the Central Blue Ridge, which would allow people to convert photos and videos to digital formats. Sadly, we've now had to reconfigure or restrict all of these mentioned spaces to meet safety and distancing needs due to the pandemic. Along with our Valley Library partners in Augusta and Waynesboro, we upgraded our integrated library software and migrated all data to the new version. And we also worked with these partners to build the foundation for a big change that took place July 1st, just out of reach for this fiscal year's report. So it's not actually mentioned in the one I submitted. That major development was the elimination of all overdue fines for patrons who use any of the Valley Library's locations. People still have to pay for lost or damaged items, but if you happen to return an item late, there's no longer a financial penalty. 
This initiative began as part of the budget process in the fall of 2019 because it would have a small impact on the library's revenue, but the benefits of going fine free have far outweighed the revenue. Removing fines provides more equitable services to our community members and takes down financial barriers to uh, access library services. I want to assure Council and the Stanton community that the hard choices we made this year were not made lightly. As librarians, we value access to information resources. We understand that the digital divide, both the access to the physical technology and the knowledge to navigate it, are a problem that our residents face. And we know that the library provides critical quality of life services that allow people to pursue lifelong learning or a little bit of escape during difficult times like this year. It broke my heart to close um, to the public earlier this year knowing that um, it would temporarily cut off this crucial access to members of our community. It felt somewhat like a librarian's um, version of an existential crisis at times. Without our building, what could we do to serve our community? We did our best during a confusing and stressful time while also prioritizing the safety of our staff and visitors. But I know that what we've done has its limitations and it couldn't reach all members of our community. I always welcome ideas on how we can better serve all of our residents. In conclu conclusion, I must absolutely say that I am incredibly proud of the library staff in normal times, but this year they handled obstacle after obstacle, change after change with grace, resilience, and creativity. I'm not sure what my report to you is going to look like next year. Um, surely the statistics will continue to be low and we will continue limited services for the foreseeable future for safety reasons. We are now, and please pardon my book pun, looking at our next chapter and adapting to this new normal, experimenting, reassessing, and striving to provide the, those essential connections to information and to each other as neighbors. Thank you for your time tonight. And at this point, I'll open the floor to you and would be happy to take any questions you may have. All right, thank you. You guys have been incredibly busy and handled it just so professionally. Um, are there any questions or comments? Mayor Dole, this is Councilwoman Mead. Councilwoman Mead. Uh, Sarah, having been on the library board, when you, uh, when you assumed that responsibility, I've really been so excited to see the changes and the improvements and the creativity that you and your staff have brought to our library in Stanton. It's just very, makes it, it should make everyone very proud. And, and so I want to congratulate uh, you and your staff for your creativity, your innovation. Um, I wanna, I'm, I'm especially impressed with the success of your team teen uh, program and with attendance there. I think that's a tough audience to reach, but um, you, you, you were managing to do it. Um, and, and to say that, you know, there, while some resist adapting to a changed paradigm and new ways of communicating and new ways of outreach, you and your staff have embraced uh, embraced that change and and, uh, and and brought new opportunities to our citizens. So thank you very much. Thank you. Are there any additional comments? Yeah, yes, this is Carolyn Dahl. Councilwoman Dahl. I just wanna say, I think you do a fabulous job as director of the library. And I wanna thank you and the staff and your awesome volunteer organization. They, they are super, they're probably uh, uh, the most energetic volunteers we have <laughs> in the city. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, thanks for a job well done. Thank you. Yes, and I would have to um, echo the sentiment. Um, the Friends of the Library are just outstanding volunteers. And without them, we could not have the library that we do it's it's such a class act and everyone contributes and as the mother of a teenager the library has always been my son's um happy place and it still is except this time it's just virtual so thank mm -hmm. you for that all right um and thank you for joining us thank so you. if you'd like to stay you're welcome to but um otherwise if you would like to um exit feel free thank you sir thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you very much all right, so the next item on the agenda is the review and approval of the FY 2022 budget calendar. All right, Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, uh, Bill Trayer, the city's chief finance officer will present this item. Thank you, Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, members of council, it's a pleasure to be here this evening. Tonight, we're here to review the FY 2022 budget calendar. This year's process has already begun and is scheduled for completion on April 8, 2021 with the adoption of the budget. This is a full two weeks ahead of last year's initial adoption date. 
Not only does this reduce an already lengthy process, but it also allows the schools to issue teachers contracts at a time which provides them an advantage during the teacher recruitment process. Uncontrollable variables include a second wave of COVID-19 and timely submission of budgets from the regional cooperatives that we are working with. Key dates, December 17th, presentation of the draft CIP to the Planning Commission. Council will receive a copy of the CIP at that time. January 28th, Council's initial review of the FY22 CIP plan that has been approved by the Planning Commission. On February 8th, we'll have an advertisement for the public hearing for the reassessment of the proposed tax rate. Per state code, localities are required to adjust their tax rate if reassessment increases the tax levies by 1% or greater. Our assessment, which, not, which is not scheduled for completion until January, is expected to exceed 1% this year. The state code requires a public notice to be advertised in a local newspaper at least 30 days in advance of the proposed public hearing date. It's been a practice of the city to advertise this date at least twice before the hearing. On February 11th, we have a joint school board city council work session, and we also have scheduled the adoption of the FY22 CIP plan. On March 11th, we'll have the city manager's proposed budget presentation along with the draft ordinance for council to consider. Also on the 11th of March, we will have a public hearing of the proposed reassessed tax rate. On March 18th, we have a budget work session, and by then we will have staff will have advertised the proposed budget ordinance. State code requires notice to the public be advertised in the local newspaper at least seven days in advance of the, of the hearing date for the proposed budget ordinance. On March 25th, we have a budget work session, and we will also have a hearing on the proposed budget ordinance. April 1st, we have a budget work session if needed. And April 8th, we'll have a budget work session and we'll, we will schedule the adoption of the budget at that time. And that's the proposed budget schedule for you to consider. All right, are there any questions or comments? Um, does anyone have any conflicts uh, with the proposed dates? Hmm. Who knows that far ahead? <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> you know the truth. All right. Thank you. <laughs> All right, thank you. All right, so the next item is item four. Uh, it's item four on the uh, work session and item A on the regular meeting uh, discussion of draft 2020 Greenways plan. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, Rodney Rhodes, the city's senior planner, will present this item. Good evening, right. Madam Mayor, city council members. Uh, a Greenways plan has been something that's been in the works for many years in the city. There's been some drafts that have been repaired uh, years ago. One was done by a student, but the city has never adopted the Greenways plan. Um, but it has been a goal of city council uh, for quite a few years. Um, and um, it's in the comprehensive plan. It's in the CIP. It's in the city council's visions and goals. Um, so it is supported by many goals and objectives of city documents and in 2018 the bicycle and pedestrian advisory committee took over the responsibility of drafting this plan so they worked on it for about two years they had a representative of the planning commission um, they provided updates to the parks and recreation um, department they received public input from a um, public meeting and an online survey and the basic design concepts are to connect popular destinations especially parks Follow the hub and spoke concept, which the hub is downtown Stanton and going out in four different directions. Um, it's to use a combination of existing sidewalks and roads plus new off-road paths. It's to mesh with other city plans and goals, such as the bike and pedestrian plan and the comprehensive plan. And it's to build up on Stanton's unique attributes. Um, uh, you know, unfortunately, uh, Stanton lacks the natural stream corridors and, um, and rail corridors that usually um, anchor a typical greenway, but Stanton does have extraordinary views from a variety of peaks and a concentration of pleasing historical and natural areas. Uh, the plan is also a long-term plan it's designed for incremental imp implementation. So you do segments at a time. Um, updates were provided to planning commission and city council in February and March of this 
year. And then a public hearing was conducted in July in front of the Planning Commission. And at the conclusion of the Planning Commission on a 4-0 vote, the Planning Commission recommended approval of the plan. Um, in advance of this meeting, we have um, uh, publicly noticed this meeting and the plan um, provided online. And um, at the direction of Sarah Holberg, the chair of the Bicycle Investment Advisory Committee, we also prepared an online survey to receive additional public input because in these days, people are less likely to come to a public meeting and also they're less likely to call in. Um, and in just over a week, um, we've received 262 responses. Wow. Um, over 250 of the respondents were in support of the Greenways plan. And over 200 of those uh, said it was, a very, it was very important and that they would use it very often. And I'd be glad to provide details and of the, that survey to the city council before your next meeting. Uh, if you'd like to read some of the comments, a lot of people took the time to actually um, write about specific routes and also about the overall plan. So we do appreciate that. Um, at this time, I will turn over to Ms. Sarah Holberg, who will provide a little bit more information about the specific routes. Thank you. Welcome, Ms. Holbrook. Um, good to be here. Um, as, as this shows, there are four distinct greenway routes in this plan. They complement each other. It's not a choice between them. They, they complement each other. They connect to destinations. And as Rodney says, they build on Stanton's unique attributes. So when BPAC approached this Greenways plan, we saw so many opportunities with the city's parks. The challenge is to enable people to get to these parks and other destinations safely on foot or bike so they can incorporate recreation and health into their daily lives. So the concept here is an urban hike where residents and visitors can experience the natural, scenic, and historic resources all within the city limits. So each of these four routes goes in a main direction and incorporates a significant park or natural destination. Two things to point out, these are conceptual routes, design would, actual design would follow. And most of the routes use existing infrastructure like sidewalks and roads. So we've marked tentative stretches where standalone paths or greenways might be built and these areas are highlighted in the, in the routes in the draft plan. So now I'll talk about the um, specific routes. Route one is north to the city limits by way of Commerce Road, and it's estimated 4.4 miles. It's a cycling walking path that goes from the heart of downtown along Commerce Road to the northern city limits um, using streets and sidewalks at first, and then the construction of a new shared use path that would also provide a connection to Bells Lane. This is the most greenway-like of the routes. Most of it would eventually be a shared use path. Um, and the features are that it offers a natural setting following Lewis Creek and passing through a pastoral area. It links to Bells Lane, an exceptionally scenic and popular two-mile rural route frequented by bicyclists, joggers, walkers, bird watchers. So one bonus of this is you would immediately make it safe to um, be able to get to Bells Lane. The route also provides important connections from downtown all the way to Verona. So that's the VSDB, VDOT, the Green Hills Industrial Park, and Augusta County offices. And if the sidewalk network is extended along Statler Boulevard, this route would also link very easily to Mary Baldwin and to the schools at um, McSwain and Stanton High School and to the YMCA and destinations on Coulter Street. So this is a very high value. It's, it could be a commuting route. It has good length and appeal for cyclists and it's not too hilly, which is hard to come by. <laughs> um, so this provides a complete corridor connecting downtown to Verona safely for both recreational and commuting cyclists. It's a central location along a primary route, fairly level, and we would anticipate it to have um, attract pretty high usage. The second route um, is, going from the wharf, all of the routes start at the wharf. 
This goes west to Gypsy Hill Park with an optional loop to Shelburne Middle School. And this is a walking and cycling route. It would follow Central Avenue from the wharf north to Churchville Avenue, then left along the creek to the main entrance at Gypsy Hill Park. It would pass through the park on Constitutional Drive with an option to continue west to Shelburne Middle School on a loop, which would include West Beverly, Grubert, and Poplar Streets. Now the features here are that it's attractively designed for pedestrians. It make use, makes use of water features beside Gum Spring Branch in two places. And with the upcoming improvements on Central Avenue, excellent sidewalks will exist most of the way from downtown to the park with the exception of the obstructed sidewalk in front of Gypsy Hill Place. The connections are to major community destinations downtown, the library, Gypsy Hill Park, it serves the Reservoir Hill Trail, the Lewis Street Public Transportation Hub, businesses along Central and Lewis and adjoining neighborhoods. And Gypsy Hill Park is a venue for high school sports and community events. And the loop to Shelburne would connect the park to key West End locations. The value is that this route also already exists. So signs and promotion could make this a highly visible cost-effective first project. The short connector serves tourists, families, the elderly, commuters, and neighborhoods. The extension to Grubert could possibly increase walking or cycling to destinations. And the wide sidewalks, the length of West Beverly Street hold the potential that maybe streetscape improvements could increase walkability and cycling in this important underserved corridor. The third route is um, an even different type of route. This is east from the wharf to the city limits by way of the villages at Stanton, Betsy, Hill Park, Betsy Bell Park, and the Frontier Culture Museum. And this would be an estimated distance of five miles. And this walking, hiking, mountain biking route from downtown to the Eastern City limits was, as I say, passed through the villages to Betsy Bell, skirt the mountain on the contour with connection to the apartment complexes and continue eastward to join the existing Mary Gray path descend to Frontier Drive near Red Oaks subdivision, cross into the Frontier Museum property and find an eastward route possibly along their entrance road to Route 250 and to the eastern city limits. The attractions here are that this route excels in natural and cultural interest. It passes through the historic villages campus, travels on fully forested trails, connects the Frontier Museum to the rest of the city, and it offers the best views in the city. It can start from the Sears Hill Overlook, and then it takes in the signature landmark Betsy Bell's Peak, which can be seen actually from most parts of the city and also from the county. It would enable hikers, walkers, and cyclists to cover distances off-road, to access trails to the summit of Betsy Bell, and to reach the Frontier Museum. It's also um, highly a high value for the diverse populations and purposes that would be served um, Betsy Bell offers distinctive hiking and viewing opportunities for tourists and residents. The trail connects to the major destinations from downtown to the eastern city limits. There could be significant economic development potential as the route passes through areas of private and public investment such as Statler Square, Statler Crossing, the Blackburn Inn, the museum, and businesses near the interstate. It also notably provides walking options for recreation and daily activities to residents in a newly developing area of the city, and a high number of people would be served by the trails. It gives access to underserved neighborhoods and population and offers a unique hiking experience. And the fourth route is southwest to Montgomery Hall Park with an optional loop, return loop by way of Lacey B. King Way. This is a cycling route. It uses enhanced infrastructure to travel from downtown um, by the cyclists would pass through Landis Park and go along Middlebrook Avenue and Lewis Street to Bridge Street and then turn left on Maple Street and then to Hale Street to cross the railroad back to Stewart Street and then to Montgomery Avenue. A new shared use path is proposed along the full length of Montgomery Hall Park where Montgomery um, Drive is so narrow. Um, so from the track crossing to the top of the hill and also a new cycling pedestrian entrance at the top. Um, across from the Lacey B. King Way. And so then you could cycle down Lacey B. King Way and return from Middlebrook Road. And that direction is, is better by bike than the opposite direction. 
So those are, are the four routes. Um, we're recommending that the plan include all four of these routes if it's adopted. Um, and one advantage of that is the city could take whatever opportunities come up whenever they are. And so there would be some advantages in being able to chip away at things and gain partners and be able to um, accommodate and development plans and that sort of thing. So if you have any questions, Rodney, I are here. Great. Are there any questions? Madam Mayor. Uh, Vice Mayor Robert. Um, Sarah, do we, do we have a timeline as far as that? Do we have an approximate cost for all four of them? Do we? No, this is this is a conceptual plan, so there's okay. no obligation to do any or all of it, and no um, no cost estimates either. As we tried to point out, ways that could be done fairly simply and straightforwardly, just as part of of city operations or when something's being worked on, anyway. You mentioned the the first one you thought would be the easiest would be to want the path along to Gypsy Hill. Or did I hear that wrong? Or oh, the yeah. I hate to number the routes, but Route 2 would be, because it already does exist, mm -hmm. but actually not many tourists see a way to get from downtown mm -hmm. to say, hey, there's this great park to get mm -hmm. them there. There are a few obstacles that could be improved, and mm -hmm. then you would have a complete route. Okay. Any additional comments or questions? Uh, thank you, Ms. Holbrook, for everything that you have done. Um, we really appreciate it. And you too, Mr. Rhodes. <laughs> All right, um, hearing no additional comments or questions, we'll move on to the next item, which is item number five on the work session and the regular meeting. It's item B, discussion of Virginia Department of Forestry, Emerald Ash Bore Removal and Replacement Cost of Share Program Award. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, Matt Sensabaugh, the city's horticulturalist, will present this item. Welcome. Well, good evening, Madam Mayor and members of council. Thank y'all for having me. I'm here to tell you a little bit about the Emerald Ash Borer Replacement Program. Uh, we have actually been approved uh, for some funds that could help us with uh, removal of some trees that are infested and then their replacement. Um, Emerald ash borer is a, it's an exotic pest that was brought into the country by accident from China uh, probably about 15 years ago. Um, the problem with the bug is when it gets into a tree, it's a wood boring insect and the nature of the damage is it's, if you could visualize just continually drilling small holes into the trunk and the branches of the tree. So when the tree becomes infested, they become really quite dangerous. Um, so we've been working over the past several years to uh, take out trees as they become infested and failed. Um, there are some chemical treatments that are available, um, but those are can be pretty costly. We've been treating a few trees in the park that are kind of historic to Gypsy Hill and go back to the early years of the park. Uh, so we've kind of decided to protect those and hang on to them. Um, but ultimately, it's going to be more cost effective to do some replacements. Um, there is one minor error in your, your packet here. There's actually two of the trees are in Gypsy Hill and two of the trees are in the downtown area. So the cost share program, um, the way it works, the forestry department will reimburse us 50% of the expenses of doing the actual removal. So that includes uh, bringing in a contractor, they get the tree on the ground and they bring in a big log truck and remove the big blocks of wood. Then on top of that, they'll also reimburse us 50% of the actual costs of our labor and equipment. Uh, so we come in behind the contractor, chip the brush, grind the stumps, and do all the fine cleanup take care of that. So they're actually going to reimburse us half of that as well. And then the last thing that they'll do is they have a $200 per tree allowance on replacement, uh, which is pretty nice. So that would give us for this project eight, $800. And the nice thing is we can actually probably purchase six or seven trees 
and plant six or seven new trees to replace them. Oh, okay. So that's kind of the basics of it. Um, you know, the deadlines, we because of the, uh, you know, the nature of the, the damage to the trees, we'd have to get them removed by December 31, which is fine. Um, and then we'd have to get the, uh, the replacements planted um, by May 31st, which is, this is also not a problem for us. Um, all four of these trees were already on my removal list for this winter, and uh, we're going to have to take them down uh, whether we accept this funding or not. Um, are there any questions or? Are there any questions? Matt, is there a way to protect these trees, what, the new ones you plant from, from you know, yeah. future infestation? Uh, what we did, the good thing is so far this bug only targets um, green and white ash and there's a species of fringe tree. So as long as we're selective in what we plant back, they shouldn't get attacked by the, the boar. Huh. Um, there are also, uh, we have three really nice old ash trees mm -hmm. that go back way to the origins of Gypsy Hill mm -hmm. and we've been uh, proactively injecting them with a uh, an insecticide for about 10 years now. So those are protected from them as well. We'll be able yeah. to hang on to them as well. Yeah, that last question was asked by Vice Mayor Robertson. I'm sorry. Uh, no, that's all right. Um, are there any additional questions or comments? Well, I'd like to say thank you for the science lesson. Oh, and when I you. Googled that little critter, He's not the cutest thing. <laughs> so. It's a pretty shade of green. Yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> All right. Did you have a comment, Mr. Sorry. Rosenberg? Madam Mayor, I was just going to say that if uh, if it meets with council's approval, uh, Ms. Beauregard or I will be happy to present this item during the regular meeting so that Mr. Sensabaugh can, can take his leave for the day. Is everybody on council? Okay. Absolutely. All right. All Thank right. you, Matt. Thank y'all very much. Have a good Thank evening. You. you too. Um, and I'd like to pause here just to um, advise Ms. Simmons for the record. Um, we do have council member Terry Holmes. He has joined us through Zoom, as well as um, the vice city manager, um, assistant city manager, <laughs> Leslie Beauregard. All right. Next item on the agenda is item number six for the uh, work session and item C for the regular meeting, a discussion of Virginia Department of Emergency Management and Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities Grant. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, John Glover, the city's building official and floodplain administrator will present this item. Welcome. Thank you. Madam Mayor, members of council, uh, as you are sure aware on August the 8th, the uh, city ex experienced the flash flood within the Gypsy Hill Park area and extending into the downtown and the wharf areas of the city. Two weeks later, we experienced the second flood of similar magnitude that impacted the wharf. As a result of these events, the city has determined to undertake a hydrologic and hydraulic study to inform the city as, as it considers various flood management um, measures that we may undertake. To fund the study, staff proposes to apply for a grant in an amount not to exceed $100,000 from the Federal Emergency Management Agency's Building Resistant Infrastructure and Communities, BRIC program, mm -hmm. um, the abbreviation. Applications of the program are made through the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. Uh, the BRIC grant program requires a 25% local match, which can be satisf satisfied with in-kind contributions, um, management of the grant, um, staff time, et cetera. Grant applications are due on November the 10th of 2020, and awards would be expected to be made next June. Um, I'm here to answer any questions you may have. All right. Does anyone on council have any questions or comments? Is this, Madam Mayor, is this similar to the uh, proposal that was done up at Ellicott City? Is the first step in their uh, uh, proposal for their, for their flood program? We're taking similar steps, but I'm not sure they were recipients of a BRIC grant. It's a pretty new program, and I don't think they utilize this grant. 
but the process they're undertaking is similar. The H and H study. Yes, the hydraulic and hydrology. Yes. 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 Right. Okay. Okay. Hydrology. All right. And just for the record, the last question asked was by Council Member Clappy. Um, are there any additional comments or questions? Okay. Hearing none. Thank you. Thank you. Um, same same thing. Yes. Um, <laughs> Yep, and um, additionally, um, I know we're, we're running a bit ahead of schedule here, um, and if it was uh, council's desire, you uh, could proceed with the next item on the agenda, which is the review of the legislative program, and defer your break until that item is completed, and then have your break um, before the closed meeting. Okay, um, is everyone on council okay with Mr. Glover um, leaving? Yes. Okay. Thank hey, you, John. Thank hey. you for the report. All right. Um, would council like to continue on? What is your pleasure? That's fine with me. Oh, it's fine. It's All right. So let's go ahead and continue onward. So the next item is the discussion of the 2021 legislative program, Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Leslie Beauregard, the city's assistant city manager, will present this item. Great, thank you. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor, members of council. Um, so each year, city council adopts a legislative program, which is transmitted to the governor, local general assembly members, the Virginia Municipal League, and Virginia First Cities. Uh, we have provided city council's program from last year, from 2020. Uh, to provide us an opportunity to discuss changes you'd like to make to the 2021 legislative program that will then be adopted either at the November or December meeting. So tonight, the purpose is to take your feedback and input and then incorporate those changes to the program for consideration at a future meeting. And you can send those suggestions to me. And at our next meeting, I'll prepare a legislative program that addresses each item. There are a couple of issues I would just like to bring to your attention that you may want to include in the 2021 agenda. The first is uh, that during, uh, during the 2020 session, there was a sovereign immunity bill that failed, but VML expects this to be back in 2021. And VML is asking localities to oppose any legislative effort to repeal or revise the doctrine of qualified immunity for government officials and instead supports action by the General Assembly to strengthen and maintain the principles of sovereign immunity for local governments and their officials. And I'm happy to share more information with council on this if um, that could be an item that you would like to include in your program. Uh, second item is has to do with the statement of economic interest required by EDA boards and directors. This was new this year and taking language directly from VML's 2021 20, legislative program they're asking the General Assembly to find a balance between financial reporting requirements on citizens, volunteers, and transparency. And as you're probably aware, that legislation came out of the Front Royal Warren County um, EDA um, embezzlement. Um, I'll call it an issue. <laughs> it was more than an issue, but that was the result of that. And then the third item is to support state funding for the addition at Middle River Regional Jail, and that will be considered during the 2021 General Assembly session. The other thing I'll do between now and the next meeting is go through any items from the 2020 program and see if there were anything that were that the General Assembly happened to do something about. I would say that's probably rare, but we'll make sure and we'll double check on that. And then finally, um, for those of you that were on council last year, we had a visit from Senator Hanger and Delegate Avoli in the December work session. We would be happy to make that invitation again to them. It was maybe a 30 minute block of time during that work session uh, right in the beginning. And so if that's something council would desire to do again, we would be happy to try to make those accommodations. Uh, yes, please. Okay. So uh, I mean, is the council agreeable? I'd, I'd love to. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. All right. I hear yes, it's okay. So now I'll, uh, we can discuss any items on the agenda. And again, I apologize for sending the VML agenda late, but it was not on their website. And yeah. I kind of had to beg and scrap for it a little bit. So I finally got that out there. Um, so I'm happy to take any comments or questions. Um, if you've had a chance to look at the program from last year, any reaction to the three items that I brought up, um, then we can start creating something new for this group. All right, are there any questions or comments at this point? And we will have continued conversation um, concerning this matter. However, if you have anything that um, 
is of interest. Um, speak now. <laughs> Mayor Oaks, this is Councilwoman Mead. Councilwoman Mead. I'm pleased to say that we can take item K off of last year's legislative agenda. We don't need to bring it forward another year. And, um, and I would also like to add that um, item B on last year's agenda, pediatric cancer research, I'd like to see us continue to support that. Absolutely. Are there any additional comments at this point? Yes, this is Carolyn Dole. Item J, uh, the predatory lending. I think uh, this past legislature addressed that uh, usury, well, it used to be, yeah, usury law of returning uh, uh, to 36%, but you know, you can check on on that, but I'm pretty sure that's that was, uh, it doesn't go into effect till till January 2021, but it's passed. <clears throat> so there would need to be um, changes on that. Ms. Beauregard, can you follow up on that? Yes, please? ma'am. All right. An another item is we might want to uh, adjust our figure on the stormwater. And I'm looking, suddenly I can't find it. Uh, to, to match VMLs or else get them to increase theirs to what, what we had said, because uh, we're saying at least 80 million. And uh, I think they were saying 50. I, I don't know that it matters. You know, it's a symbolic uh, worth support of it. Okay. Anyone else? All right, hearing none, we are now on break. Thank you. We're back. And at this time, I will entertain a motion to go into a closed meeting for discussion and consideration of the engagement of candidates for special counsel to advise city council concerning the recruitment and employment for the position of city attorney and for the consultant to conduct such recruitment. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move the council enter a closed meeting for the discussion and consideration of the engagement of candidates for special counsel to advise city council concerning the recruitment and employment for the position of city attorney and a consultant to conduct such recruitment pursuant to Virginia code section 2.2-3711A1. Okay, we have a motion. Do we have a second? Second. second. Terry Holmes. All right, Council Member Holmes, second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Ms. Lee. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dole. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oates. Aye. Motion carries. Okay, we are now in closed session. All right, I'll entertain a motion to go into open meeting. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. I move that council reconvene in an open meeting and certify to the best of each member's knowledge that only lawfully exempted public business matters were discussed and that only public business matters as identified in the closed meeting motion were heard, discussed, or considered in the meeting. All right, we have a motion. Is there a second? Is there a second? Madam Mayor, I second. All right, we have a second. Any further discussion? Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mr. Holmes. No. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Dole. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Motion carries. Okay. We are back in an open meeting and at this time we will take a break and we will uh, come back at 730 for the regular meeting. Thank you. As mayor, I call this meeting of Stanton City Council to order. 
I note that this meeting is being broadcast over the city's cable channel and stream live on the city's website so that members of the public may hear our meeting. The meeting is also being recorded. I ask the clerk of council to call the roll for confirmation of those council members present for today's meeting. Mayor Oaks. Here. Ms. Darby. Here. Mr. Holmes. Here. Mr. Claffey. Here. Vice Mayor Robertson. Here. Ms. Dahl. Here. Ms. Mead. Here. I confirm that all council members are present. All right, thank you. I ask that the city manager, Steve Rosenberg, note the participation of any city officials or colleagues or anyone else during today's meeting by Zoom or telephone. Madam Mayor, Council Members Dull and Mead are participating on the Zoom platform. All other city employees and officials are participating in chambers. Uh, except for <laughs> Council Member Holmes. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> Uh, Council, Council Member Holmes is also participating on the Zoom platform. Thank you, Vice Mayor Robertson. And we can't forget you, Terry. <laughs> All right, thank you. Please let me mention that notice reasonable under the circumstances of this meeting has been given to the public contemporaneously with the notice provided to members by of City Council. In addition to limited public seating in City Hall, access to this meeting has been provided to the public by audio feed on the city's cable channel and the city's website. During matters from the public on council's agenda towards the end of the meeting, public comments will be taken in person and by telephone. Members of the public who wish to participate in such matters by telephone at the appropriate time may call 844-854-2222 and when prompted, enter the access code 619358 hashtag. Callers will be recognized in order. The public is reminded matters from the public is a time for council simply to listen to your comments. Each speaker will be limited to five minutes. Detailed instructions for public participation by telephone have been publicized over the course of the past week on the city's website and Facebook page and can be found on the agenda for this meeting and on the council's website at www.ci.stanton.ba dot us backslash government backslash city dash council also let me highlight and have reflected in the meeting minutes that this meeting although being conducted in person is also being conducted by zoom with virtual participation of certain members of city council given the catastrophic catastrophic nature of the declared emergency and disaster related to the COVID 19 outbreak which is part of the total circumstances makes it impractical or unsafe to assemble in a single location. The meeting is being held consistent with the City Council Ordinance 2020-04 regarding continuity of government, a copy of which can be found online at www.stanton.va.us backslash C-O-G-O-R-D T-2020-04. Uh, I'm going to read that again www.stanton.va.us backslash C-O-G-O-R-D 2020-04. All right. I'd also like to uh, comment that uh, if you do come into the chambers or even uh, in City Hall, please wear your mask. If you would like to speak under uh, matters from the public uh, and also when we have the public hearing, uh, you may remove your mask at the microphone. We do offer um, sanitizing wipes if you uh, care to wipe the microphone. Um, in addition, I would like to just remind the council members uh, to ask to be recognized by the mayor and the mayor will recognize you by name so everyone can know who all is speaking. All right, the next item on the agenda is the Pledge of Allegiance. If you so choose, please join me in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right. The next item is the invocation moment of silence, and tonight it is Council Member Claffey's turn. Um, Councilmember Clappy. 
Thank you. Tonight, I'd like to take a minute to mourn the loss of a Stanton legend, Mr. Alphonse Hamilton, who passed away Monday night at the age of 91. <clears throat> Earlier this month, my wife assisted Mr. and Ms. Hamilton in this very building when they came in to cast their votes. They were, of course, dressed alike, as always, and it was outgoing friendly, gracious as ever. It is great to see what a model citizen he was to the very end. Local coverage this week has mentioned Mr. Hamilton's Booker T. Washington teaching days and state basketball championship days of 62 and 63. But I remember him as a principal responsible for discipline at the newly integrated Lee High School high upon a hill in front of the park. It was in the late 60s, a very tough time. Segregation was becoming integration, the Vietnam War, massive protest everywhere. And we had about a thousand students in three grades at Lee High School. Mr. Hamilton was tasked with keeping us in line. <laughs> I may have been part of the problem. If I recall correctly, I received 20 some hours detention hall from Mr. Hamilton <laughs> my junior year. I may have had a tardiness issue at the time, but I never blamed Mr. Hamilton. He taught me some good lessons on personal responsibility. He was fair, he was compassionate, he could be tough, but he always talked gently and commanded your complete respect. He was a great man. Our sincere condolence to his wife, Catherine, and his sons, Carlton, a member of the class of 69, Maurice was 73, and the youngest son, Tony. May he rest in peace. Alphonse Hamilton. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, next is the mayor's report. And, um, since um, I'm, oh, yeah, I'm going to take a break. I'm going to mention um, Mr. Hamilton, but I, I've got to take a break because it's such a loss for the city. So at this time, under the mayor's report, I would ask that... Um, Tony Bowers and her um, Miss Queen City Queens to enter the chambers, please. All right, y'all oh, look at this. Hey guys, wow. look how beautiful. Oh my goodness, you guys are so beautiful. Oh, um, Tony, would you care to say a few words? Up here? Yes, please. My, I'm gonna pull this down so you oh, can hear me if that's okay. Um, hi everyone, I'm Tony Bowyer and um, uh, I'm here to present some a, a great donation. <laughs> um, I had held a pageant about a month ago. It's probably not even been a month ago, maybe three weeks ago, called um, Miss Queen City, and it was a benefit pageant for the city of Stanton for the flood relief. I'm happy to report that we raised five thousand um, dollars. So, yeah. So I have those here to present, and it wasn't just me alone. It was lots of us coming together. Um, several of our queen. Queens are right here behind me that um, won titles at the Queen City. Um, so, it, it, like I said, it was lots of people coming together um, to make this happen. We had some girls that reached out and um, we had a People's Choice contest as part of it. And they reached out to family and friends for donations that helped towards this as well. Um, so, it wasn't just me. It was... Lots of people, I just directed it. I mean, it's, it's a lot of work to do them, but um, I'm happy and honored to do it because I love Stanton. I live in Stanton and I've lived here for 15 years. Both of my children are at Stanton High School. So 
um, we're, we're big supporters and we, I know when the floods hit, we went down as a family to downtown and tried to help out that day. Um, and then seeing everything made me say, hey, we need to do something um, to help these businesses. So I said, I've held lots of benefit pageants in the past and um, they've always been successful raising money for different, um, different things such as childhood cancer or um, just if uh, veterans and just, I mean, list goes on and on, but, um, and I don't know, if, for those of you, when you hear the word pageant, you think, oh gosh, toddlers and tears maybe. And, um, but these girls, um, it's all about community service. It's more, it's more about just than just the beauty and the girl in a, in a shiny hat. It's, it's, these girls give back to their communities constantly. Um, and the confidence and the interviewing skills and the scholarship money um, I mean, my daughter alone, I, I mean, the scholarship money is amazing. So it's not, it's not about uh, a girl with a bunch of makeup on a, and on a, and a dress and a stage. It's it, beyond that. Um, they, they have to interview and they have to speak and there's a lot more to it. And so when you think about Miss Americas, I mean, they're, they're scientists, they're uh, doctors, they're lawyers, they're nurses. So these, these are successful women. Um, so when you think of the word pageant, don't, I want people to know too, it's more than just um, a girl in, a, in, in makeup and in a, in a dress with a shiny crown. It's, it's way beyond that. So, um, but I'm proud of them and thank you guys. And we are happy yes, to. Thank you. And yeah. um, you are exactly right. It is so much more. It is raising $5,000 for your city that yeah. has uh, gone through a devastating flood. So thank you so yeah. much. Uh, can we possibly bring all the uh, queens yeah. up here so everybody can see? You can do your wave. <laughs> <laughs> do a little wave. Good job. So you even have the littlest queen. Yeah, Look. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Look at that. <laughs> and did anyone else want to speak? <laughs> yes, please. Oh, please, oh, yeah, please. And I too am going to lower my mask. I'm Lil She Huffman, Miss Virginia Senior America 2019 and 2020. Mm -hmm. And part of my contribution to this pageant was I made queen sock dolls and sold them um, for with all of the proceeds going to, I made and donated with all of the proceeds going to the proceeds for the pageant. But the pageant also honored our mayor as honorary Miss Queen City. And so I would like to honor her with the honorary Miss Queen City 2020 mayoral doll. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Good job, everybody. Yeah, thank thank you. you very much. Well, again, thank you. Um, for that most generous donation. And it's great to see 
uh, so many folks to, to come out and help Stanton in its time of need, so thank you. Um, also, I would like to give recognition to Kurt Prosp and Sam Perkins. They are pageant directors in uh, the city of Stanton. They held a Miss Stanton pageant and they had one contestant to raise over $700 uh, to go towards the flood relief in the city of Stanton. And that check was presented to Mr. Rosenberg earlier in the week. So thank you. Um, next, uh, I would like to mention that um, I attended the uh, Fish and Derby Day, the Kids Fish and Derby Day um, with uh, Will Helmlich and it was quite a success. A lot of kids were there and they were catching the big ones. I think um, Councilman Claffey was also in attendance and how big was the uh, the winner? I don't know, like 20 feet long. No, no, no. <laughs> fishing stories. There, there's fishing stories. That's a pretty good one there. So, but uh, anyway, the kids all seem to have a really good time. Um, also, I uh, through uh, Zoom, actually it was um, it, it was virtual. Um, I can't remember if it was Zoom or not, but it was virtual. I uh, attended along with uh, Councilwoman Dole, the graduation of the 100th graduate of the drug court. That was um, very impressive. It's always great to see um, folks that um, are given a second chance and able to just make the best of it. Um, we uh, wish the graduate much success. Um, oh, let's see here. Also, I wanted to mention that the Shenandoah Green will be having on November 6th a tree celebration at Stanton High School um, at 2 p.m. If I'm not mistaken, they've already had their first round of planting trees throughout the city, which is very exciting. Um, and I would like to wrap up by reiterating what um, Council Member Claffey to, excuse me, I've got to take a drink of water. Council Member Claffey mentioned the, the passing of Alfonso Hamilton. Um, Mr. Hamilton, for me, I called him Daddy Hamilton. He was a father figure for so many of us and we loved him dearly. Uh, his passing is truly a loss for Stanton, but a gain, a oh, tremendous gain for the heavens. Um, many, many prayers to his family. Uh, Mama Hamilton, we are praying for you. We are thinking of you. And I, I, it, this has been such, such a loss for the city. Uh, what a good, good gentleman um, Daddy Hamilton was to all of us. And with that, I will open up the floor for additional items by members of council. This is Carolyn Dull. Councilwoman Dull. First, I'd like to say I, I hope everyone had a very good Indigenous Peoples Day on the 12th, first ever for Virginia. Uh, also, uh, uh, I attended virtually uh, the golf meeting. So that uh, committee has gotten off to a start. Uh, the Shenandoah Valley Partnership had their Fall Economic Development Forum. Uh, and as, as Ms. Oak said, we, uh, we both attended the 100th graduation uh, for the Stanton uh, Drug Court. So uh, that's, that's a really good uh, alternative uh, to uh, prison. Uh, to get those folks help and get them uh, on a good path. I also attended the Virginia Department of Criminal Justice Services Committee on Training uh, as a member and also the full board of the Criminal Justice Services Board. And there, there's going to be an immense uh, number of, of reforms and changes in the laws regarding policing and um, all kind of ancillary 
uh, item. So there'll be a, a lot of things happening. I'm sure Chief Williams will be on top of them. All right, are there any additional items by members of council? Okay, hearing none, I'll move on to the next item, which is the approval of the minutes. I'll entertain a motion to approve the work session and regular meeting minutes of October 8th, 2020. Anyone? <laughs> Madam Mayor. Uh, Council Member Clappy. <laughs> I move we approve the minutes of the work session and regular meetings of October 8th, 2020. All right, so we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second, second here, Terry Holmes. Sorry, I went, to, I went to do the, the thing, but I had my mute on. <laughs> oh, that's all right. Uh, we have a second by Council Member Holmes. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Mayor Oates. Aye. Ms. Meads. Aye. Mr. Clappy. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. The next item on the agenda is item A, a public hearing on draft 2020 Greenways plan. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor Rodney Rhodes, the city senior planner will present this item. Good evening, Madam Mayor Oaks, city council members. As we um, uh, discussed during the work session today, um, a Greenways plan for the city has been a long-term goal. Um, it is supported by the comprehensive plan and various goals and objectives. It has been supported by various citizen surveys throughout the years, including the survey from 2019. It has also been on city council's visions and goals. It has been in the city council's capital improvements uh, plan. Um, and for the past two years, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Committee has taken over the, the role of drafting and creating this draft plan. A representative of the Planning Commission was included in those meetings and updates were given on a regular basis to Department of uh, Parks and Recreation. Uh, the committee received public input from public meetings and also an online survey. Um, and after um, working on that for a couple of years, um, it was presented to the Planning Commission and to the City Council back in February and March, just before you know what happened with COVID. Uh, so therefore the public hearing before the Planning Commission was delayed until July. And at that Planning Commission, the Commission on a 4-0 vote recommended approval of the plan as presented by staff. I would note that to today's public hearing has been properly advertised. We received a handful of emails all supporting the plan. But in addition to that, uh, Sarah Holberg, the Bicycle and Pedestrian Advisory Chair, recommended that we do prepare an online survey for people that were not comfortable either coming here to this meeting or calling in. And um, that turned out to be a wonderful success. All the committees chipped in with comments as far as how what questions we should ask. And uh, Ms. Smith and the city manager's office put it all together, put it online, um, put it out there on social media. And we had 262 people fill out that online survey. Um, over 250 of them um, stated that greenways were important or valuable to the community. And over 200 of those 250 said it was very important and that they would use it on a regular basis. And at this time, I'll let Sarah Holberg provide um, some details on the four routes. Hey, welcome, Sarah Holberg. I have to apologize. During the work session, I called you Holbrook. And Sarah, how many years have I known you? <laughs> My apologies. And I think this is the third month in a row she's been here at City Council. I know. <laughs> she's a regular. Honorary member. <laughs> well, I, I will say that I don't have anything else on the schedule in front of you all, so this might be it. <laughs> um, so, um, as we spoke earlier, there are four distinct greenway routes in this plan. They complement each other. They are not in competition. So the plan is to in include them all. Um, we have sort of a concept of an urban hike where 
residents and visitors can experience natural, scenic, and historic resources all within the city limits. And so I'll go through the routes very quickly. There are four routes, but I do want to point two things out. These are conceptual routes. The actual design would come later. And most of the routes use existing infrastructure like sidewalk and roads and marked in the Greenway plan, which is a draft is on the city website. Um, you can see the stretches where there might be standalone Greenway paths. The first route um, goes, all of the routes start at the wharf and go each in a major direction. Route one goes north to the city limits by way of Commerce Road. It's about 4.4 miles. It's a cycling and walking path. And its highlights are that it would be a good long route, good for commuting to get from the city to Verona with all the destinations in between, and is also very good for recreation and provides a connection to Bells Lane, which is already a phenomenal um, spot for people to recreate. The second route would go from the wharf to west to Gypsy Hill Park with an optional loop to Shelburne Middle School. And that one is um, already um, partly in existence and could be promoted and, and improved more. Much of the route is already attractively designed for pedestrians and the Central Avenue improvements would, would, would contribute to that. So this is really good for everybody, families, tourists, all the um, users of the major destinations, the library and the park. The third route is east to the city limits by way of the villages at Stanton, Betsy Bell Park, and the Frontier Culture Museum. This is a walking, hiking, mountain biking route from downtown to the eastern city limits, passing through all of those sites. And it uh, would excel in natural and cultural interests and also connect to the Frontier Museum to the city. The final route is southwest to Montgomery Hall Park with an optional loop um, by way of Lacey B. King. And this is a cycling route, would use mostly existing infrastructure and add a, a multi-use path along Montgomery Hall Park and an additional um, bike pad entrance to, to the park. So those are the four routes and we look forward to hearing public comments. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we're gonna have a public hearing on the matter. Um, I will... I will gain, uh, bang the gavel and that will begin the public hearing. We have five minutes to speak at the microphone. Um, please state your name and your address. And once everyone's had a chance to speak, I will bang the gavel to conclude the public hearing. And with that, the public hearing is now open. Would anyone care to address the council? Oh, this is just about it. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Hi. Hey, I'm Dwayne Barron. I live at 301 Good Street. I didn't come here specifically for this thing, but this is really exciting. Mm -hmm. This is fantastic. Um, I really appreciate Sarah's work over the years on this. I hadn't actually seen it until tonight. I looked at it in the agenda. It looks really great. I, I'm very excited about this mm -hmm. idea for Stanton. I really think it's a good idea. So mm -hmm. I encourage you guys to work to making this re reality. Definitely. Thank, you, Thank you. Would anyone else in the audience like to speak? concerning the public hearing. Um, Mr. Rosenberg, do we have anyone? We have two callers on the line and we can check to see whether either of them are calling concerning this matter. Okay, go ahead, please. The caller whose number ends in seven five, are you on the line? I am, but I wanted to comment at the end of the session. Okay, very good. We'll place you back in the queue, thank you. The caller whose number ends in T9, are you on the line? Uh, yes, this is Fred Blanton, and I actually did want to speak about the Greenways plan, if that's okay. Yes, please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Um, hi, this is uh, Fred Blanton, and I live at 200 Federal Street, uh, Sam, Virginia. And uh, I'm calling on uh, in the capacity of the new chair of the uh, Lewis Creek Watershed Advisory Committee. Um, we, uh, we talked about this plan a little bit too, and we're actually all very much in favor of this. So I just want to go on record uh, that our committee's in favor of this plan from um, 
from the from Sarah's committee. Uh, I also wanted to say that even though I, I know that some of the other committees were consulted, I, I wasn't aware that ours was. However, it's okay because uh, we think this is a great plan and we hardly endorse it. Uh, the one comment I'd make, though, is uh, from our perspective of uh, the Lewis Creek watershed, um, what we'd like to do, and I've already talked with Sarah about this, so it isn't a surprise to her, is going forward, if this plan is approved, we'd like to work with our committee uh, to possibly enhance it in certain ways to allow more intersections with uh, Lewis Creek or the, the watershed. And just two examples are uh, path number one that she highlighted. Uh, once you get just right outside of town, uh, Lewis Creek does sort of veer off and there's an opportunity there for, uh, for a, a, a separate or an additional path. And then on path number four, the interesting thing about that one is it's heading down uh, out of town. It actually intersects with um, the, um, the Nabisco warehouse site. If anyone was at the West End uh, development meeting the other night, um, uh, Mayor X, I know you were there. And uh, what's interesting about this is that uh, there's that Nabisco warehouse site, which was one of the three sites that was chosen uh, for the new um, grant for EPA. And if that uh, goes forward and, and turns out okay, and that area, which I believe the consultant was suggesting could be a great uh, green space, it's right there along the creek as well. And so we're hoping that that could be enhanced uh, as part of this plan. So again, uh, Lewis Creek Watershed Advisory Committee strongly endorses this, um, this plan. And, uh, and we hope that you all consider it and, and uh, make, it a, make it a reality. Thanks. Thank you. Is there anyone else? Is the caller whose number ends in 05 on the line? Yes. And do you wish to address the Greenways plan? Yes. Please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Yes, my name is Randolph Burton and I live at 211 Hendron Avenue. I'm just calling to express my full support of the Greenways plan. I believe we need to ensure that citizens can access uh, various areas of our wonderful city um, without using a car. And these kinds of facilities where people can easily and safely walk and cycle around town really enhance the quality of life in a community. And uh, I hope the city council will be fully behind this project. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's the last caller. Okay. All right. Um, would anyone else from the audience like to address the Greenways plan? Hearing none, the public hearing is now closed. So, Madam Mayor, the, um, as indicated in the agenda briefing, uh, we will have this scheduled for consideration by council at your meeting in November on November 12th. And if you have any questions in the meantime, I'm sure that uh, Mr. Rhodes would be pleased to receive those and to respond to them in advance of that meeting on the 12th. Okay. Thank you. All right, moving on to the next item. It's item B, consideration of Virginia Department of Forestry Emerald Ash War Removal and Replacement Coast Share Program oh. Award. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, uh, Ms. Beauregard, Assistant City Manager, will present this item. Great, thank you. Um, please don't ask me to make do that science um, <laughs> lecture that Mr. Sensabaugh did. I'm sorry. I, I just the only thing I remembered is that they're exotic invasive pests. They're from China. And they're from China. <laughs> so this is we're asking City Council tonight to approve a grant. Um, received by the Virginia Department of Forestry in the amount of $3,429.75 to help the city with the removal and replacement of four large ash trees. Two of those are in Gypsy Hill Park and two are located near downtown. Um, this is a 50% cost share. Um, the city is responsible for 50% of the cost. Um, again, it is to remove trees that um, while some preventative measures sometimes work, normally the 
process is to simply remove the trees and to plant new ones, which is what this these funds would do. Mm -hmm. And so our city share is two thousand six hundred seventy nine dollars and seventy five cents. Um, and what we're asking council tonight is to authorize the application of this grant and the acceptance of the grant funds both retroactively. Again, please don't ask me any scientific questions. Does anyone have any <laughs> questions for the assistant city manager, Leslie Beauregard? Mr. Sensenball did say that they had a very pretty green tint to them. I have to Google that. That was their only redeeming quality, as I recall. Yes. All right. Um, hearing no Madam questions, um, Vice Mayor Robertson. Madam Mayor, I move the City Council authorize staff to apply for the Virginia Department of Forestry Emerald Ash Borer Removal and Replacement Cost Share Program Award retroactively to September 3rd, 2020 as proposed. Okay, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Council Member Claffey. A second. We have a second. Any further discussion? Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Mayor Oates. Aye. Motion carries. Thank you. The next item is item C, consideration of Virginia Department of Emergency Management building resilient infrastructure and communities grant. Mr. Rosenberg. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, members of council, uh, as you heard from John Glover, the city's building official and floodplain administrator during the work session, this grant application follows from the flood events in the city that occurred last August. Uh, in the aftermath of those events, we arranged for uh, an engineer with Howard County, Maryland, uh, to brief council about that locality's experiences in Ellicott City, which is the county seat in Howard County, as an example of um, measures that were taken uh, to try to address repeated flood events in, in that locality. And, and learning from those lessons, we've made a determination to move forward with a hydrologic and hydraulic study to give us information to help us consider uh, and to prioritize various flood management measures. This uh, grant program uh, through the Federal Emergency Management Agency has been identified as a possible source of funding for the study that we uh, intend to procure. Uh, we propose to apply for a grant in an amount not to exceed $100,000. Um, and those applications are made uh, through the Virginia Department of Emergency Management. There's a 25% local match requirement, but that can be satisfied with in-kind contributions by the city. So there, there's no fiscal outlay required on the part of the city uh, whatever staff efforts are undertaken um, in conjunction with the, the study to support it um, qualify as the local match. The applications are due on November 10th, and we would expect to learn whether the city receives the grant sometime next June. I'd be pleased to answer any questions you have. Are there any questions for Mr. Rosenberg? I'm hearing none. I'll entertain a motion. Madam no. Mayor. Council Member Darby. I move that City Council Council authorize staff to apply for a Building Resilient Infrastructure and Communities grant in an amount not to exceed $100,000 through the Virginia Department of Emergency Management to fund a hy hydrologic and hydraulic study as proposed. All right, we have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Madam Mayor. Council Member Clappy. Second. Second. All right, any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mayor Oates. Aye. Ms. Mead. Aye. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Mr. Holmes. Aye. Ms. Darby. Aye. Ms. Dahl. Aye. Motion carries. 
All right, thank you. The next item is item D, an update on the allocation of CARES Act relief funds. Mr. Rosenberg. Madam Mayor, Ms. Beauregard will present this item. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Um, so we've heard about the CARES Fund a lot the past several months. Um, the city ended up receiving $4.3 million in total um, after the initial allocation of 2.175 um, between May and July. And so very generally, CARES Act funds can be used to, um, for qualifying expenses to address the public health emergency with respect to COVID-19 mm -hmm. are not accounted for in your budget recently approved as of March 27, 2020, and were incurred during the period that begins on March 1st, 2020 and ends on December 30th, 2020. And we're coming up very quickly to December 30th. Um, so tonight staff will be providing a briefing to council concerning the use of the CARES Act relief funds and addressing the following two topics, and, and, and I think this order makes sense is to start talking about the nonprofit application process first. Um, and as an FYI, staff, um, we presented, what I'll talk about second is the balanced budget that we presented mm -hmm. and I provided to city council to look at and to kind of give their blessing. Um, I'm not asking necessarily for a formal vote, just some guidance and a blessing mm -hmm. to move forward, either with, you know, with the nonprofit process and that you're comfortable with how we've outlined the final budget of the CARES uh, funding. Uh, so let me start talking about the nonprofit process first. Okay. And in the budget, you'll see that we have proposed using $200,000 of the remaining CARES Act funds to fund a grant program that would directly support nonprofit organizations in the city. I attached an example from the city of Waynesboro. It would look very similar to this example. Um, it's very similar to the business grants that the city provided a, a month or so ago as well. Similar eligibility, but on the nonprofit side. And staff has also been in discussion with Dan Lehman of the Community Foundation of the Central Blue Ridge, and he has confirmed that he can assist the city with the development and administration of such a program of council so desires. And if you all approve this concept tonight, then staff will work with the Community Foundation on the logistics to make this happen. Um, and so we need to work on the nuts and bolts with Mr. Lehman following this meeting if this process is approved. It would be simple given the time frame that we're under. We're hitting, we're really under the gun now. The city would probably most likely prepare an MOU with the foundation that would outline their role in ours. Um, and the application would follow all the guidelines and eligibility criteria required within the CARES Act. That is the provision of grants to help reimburse costs caused by service interruption, closure, and increased costs related to COVID-19 prevention measures. Um, we can talk a little bit about the structure of this and the dollar amount. Um, there's many ways to go with that. Originally, when we had, when you all had discussed the business grants, that original amount was $250,000 and the grant cap was 10,000. Mm -hmm. And then we increased the amount to 500,000 and the grant cap was 12,500. Mm -hmm. So maybe a $10,000 cap makes sense. Again, it's hard to predict how many nonprofits might apply for the grant. So it would all have to be within the realm of that $200,000 budget. Mm -hmm. However, that would work out. Um, but to come up with a cap would be wonderful <laughs> so that we could have to let nonprofits know and then they would submit their eligible expenses and then determining, you know, within the budget of the 200,000, how that would all fit in. And that those would be the grant awards to the nonprofits. Um, like I said, Mr. Lehman and I can kick this around and come up with a process quickly. I think he's been working already with Augusta County on their process. We might actually be able to have a joint application. So you would click either your in the city or in the county, and that might be one way to go. So there's lots of different ways to do this. Um, but the direction really from you is, is $200,000. Um, Mr. Lehman seems to think that would be a good amount. Um, and then what the maximum amount would be per applicant. Um, and again, it would depend entirely on what type of eligible expenses they submit to the city in support of that application. So I'll be happy to answer any questions about that first. All right, are there any questions for Ms. Beauregard? Um, Vice Mayor Roberts. Le Leslie, I'm, I'm just talking and, and my, my buddy over here to my left, he, he might have a better, <laughs> what, because I asked you earlier, we've had so, so many emails and calls from from people, you know, our some of our nonprofit businesses downtown that really said they need help. It, okay, what would it 
what would happen if we increased it to two and a, you know a quarter of a million, two twenty five or or two hundred twenty five, and and maybe made the cap at twelve? I mean, is that going to? You would have to figure out where you're going to take it from in another area and, and gotcha. see. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's fine. I mean, it's it's all obviously it's up to you. And if you direct right. us to increase, and I don't know what my cancel might find a place to take it from within the CARES money that's left. No, I understand. Yeah. I, we just had so many you sure. know. Understood. Too many calls and, and businesses that are hurting and, and because of COVID and everything and trying to help them stay afloat. Um, well, and this would just be for the nonprofit. So yeah, we've right, done the I'm small saying. business grants already. So yeah. if you're a 501c3, that's the first litmus okay. test to eligibility right. for this pot of funding. Uh, this is Carolyn yeah. Dole. That's a woman, Dole. Uh, I'm... Uh, I'm inclined to see if council would consider taking 100k out of the contingency fund because we're getting close to the end of the the spending period, and making it 300,000, and then using some type of criteria, uh, such as uh, payroll, uh, because we have some large nonprofits and we have some small nonprofits. And you know, giving 10K to a large nonprofit is not going to save anybody's job. And so, you know, I'm just throwing that out there for for people to think about. Great. Are there any thoughts concerning Councilwoman Dole's suggestion? Hey, Aaron, it's just a friend of me, uh, Councilwoman Mead. I, I think Carolyn has. I think that's a great idea. And and to her point. You know, I, I'll, I'll just take the American Shakespeare Center as an example. Their annual payroll is $1.7 million. And, uh, and if, if that organization fails, that's, and that $1.7 million is not money that comes from one pocket in the city of Stanton and goes to another. That's money that comes from the pockets of the people in Northern Virginia and North Carolina and Pittsburgh and New York City and all over the world who come to Stanton to see plays at the Blackfriars Playhouse and to do and to and to participate in programs with the American Shakespeare Center. A ten thousand dollar cap for the American Shakespeare Center simply would not uh, wouldn't it, it, it just doesn't move the dial at all. And so, to the extent we could make uh, make it. Uh, more tiered toward the impact and size of the organization, uh, I, I think I think that uh, is something that I could support, and I, I could also definitely support increasing the amount um, uh, from two hundred to three hundred thousand. Um, Madam Mayor, Vice Mayor Robertson, <clears throat> Ms. Mead, I, I understand that, and I'm I'm not against that I, because we can't afford to lose American Shakespeare Theater, but my question to Leslie is, I think I asked you that before, are, are we double dipping with care fund? Because I didn't think, because I- well, So, okay, there's a couple of different thoughts going on here. Um, the, so speaking to what you asked me about earlier, mm -hmm. any organization, if they received, for instance, the payroll protection from that pot of CARES federal money, they could not use our funding for that same purpose. It has to be for a different purpose. Okay. So that's the first eligibility requirement. Um, so that answers that question. Going back to the idea about the tiered approach, Mr. Lehman and I had talked that, about that approach. We had looked at it from a total budget. That was one thought we had. So we didn't identify payroll necessarily. We talked about maybe we do a tiered approach on the total budget of the organization and you do different layers at that point. Um, so that was an, so since that's been brought up, I'll just mention that that was one idea that Mr. Lehman and I had kicked around mm -hmm. at one point. And I don't know who else did that. We may be the only ones that are taking that approach and that's mm -hmm. fine. I think everybody that I've seen did a flat amount. Um, so that might address some of the other concerns about larger nonprofits with larger budgets. Um, but again, it would still depend on what their eligible costs are. So the budget is one thing, but that won't determine their award because their awards entirely based on what have they spent, what expenses have they had directly related to the health pandemic. So the budget is just one aspect of that. That could be one criteria, only in the sense that you're determining the award amount that they're getting, not necessarily, but it's not really helping in another area. But that is one okay. thought that Mr. Lehman and I have kicked around. Okay. 
This is Carolyn Dahl. Councilwoman Dole. I, I, I think that's point, point of order. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Robertson. I, w I reckon I've heard enough. I was chastised by Ms. Mead last week for showing respect. We have been in this since the very beginning. And Ms. Dahl, you have yet to refer to the mayor as Madam Mayor, Mayor Oaks, or anything else except something detrimental. I'm simply asking, as, as I was told a long time ago, if you want respect, show some respect. And that's all I ask. I'll try to treat you with respect if you treat the mayor with a little bit of respect. And that's all I've really got to say about that. Thank you. Council Member Dole. May I speak, Vice Mayor Robertson? Ma'am, go right ahead. Go ahead and cancel woman, Dole. I was simply going to say that sounded like a good way to assign money by the total budget. And it's up to the, the individual nonprofits whether they have uh, expenses that qualify. I imagine most of them do. Okay, um, Ms. Beauregard. So at this point in time, uh, you're looking for direction from this council. Correct. Is it possible to um, run the numbers with what uh, Council Member Dole has suggested compared to, you know, the ten thousand dollar cap that you had referred to earlier? Um, I'm not sure. I, I mean, I think whatever we decide to do, we can make it work. Um, I don't know if I need to run any more numbers. We just one, we don't know how many are going to apply. So okay. it's really hard to say. Okay. Um, you know, if we either do the flat amount or the tiered approach, I think Mr. Lehman and I could come up with a plan to make either of those work. We've talked about it both ways. Um, I think if you're going to do the tiered approach, you need to, you know, the 10, 15, 20, you know, how does that work necessarily? And um, so I don't think I need to run the numbers. I think if you all can just give us the guidance tonight to say, if you want to say 300,000, we can figure out, you know, some, it's got to come from somewhere else on this sheet right here. That's the only thing is we have to figure out where the under 100,000 is coming from. Madam um, Mayor. Um, yes, sir. Uh, uh, Vice Mayor Robertson. Leslie, just want to make sure. So I, I'm assuming I was 100,000 and I, like I said, I, we cannot afford to lose Shakespeare here. We've got to at least help them. I mean, they, they bring in too much money. Um, but I'm just looking at you said reserve for future anticipated is 118, not let's say 119,000. I mean, that's going to, if we took it all out of that, we're looking at 8,900 left. Um, is, I mean, is that going to adversely, I mean, can, can we conceivably do that? I mean, without, or maybe a little bit from here, a little bit from there. And I, I, I was just I looking at that reserve for future anticipated. So that would leave us with, with 8,000. 8, 18, 8, excuse me, 18,009. I'm sorry. Uh, uh, close to 19,000. Yeah, close to 19. Is that going to hurt too bad or? Um, I, you know, I, it's hard to say. I think we could. Um... It impacts the, it impacts flexibility. Yeah, that's so you know, <laughs> we can't anticipate <laughs> what has yet to come to our attention. Right. And the, you'll recall the reserve was larger. Right, we took we yeah. the fire department. Yes, yep. exactly. And so if we continue to take the reserve and designate it for specific purposes. Okay. It, but we got to get rid of it before December 31st. Right. 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 So we're so, down to 60 days. We're down to 60 yeah. days. Pretty much. Exactly. I mean, there, we've, we've basically told departments, we're done. <laughs> This is it. That we're making final decisions, and so we shouldn't get any other large requests. In, to okay. be honest with you, um, I think. And also, if you look at the top where you've approved some of these expenses already, mm -hmm. we know there's been there's probably will be some savings in those areas anyway. So that could get moved down and around. Okay. So, yeah, it limits our flexibility. It's not the end of the world, I don't think. Um, I think we could live within that probably. 
And like I said, we do only have 60 days left. There's only so much we can do at right. this point. Nothing mm -hmm. big is going to get done at this point that hasn't already been started and in the budget itself that you have before you. Madam Mayor. Vice Mayor Robertson. Ms. Dahl, would you like to make that motion? Well, there's, um, we don't. Do we ever? No, it's just direction. We're oh, not, oh, well, okay. Yeah, we're, we're not um, asking for a motion at this time. Um, so any other thoughts from council members? I mean, I any Madam, direction, Madam Mayor. I, Councilman I think, Clapper. I think the hundred and eighteen thousand nine hundred and eight dollars that you have in reserve should be committed tonight, and you should have no reserves except what you're telling me that you haven't spent all the money above. So we're going to have a few extra dollars left over. Oh, no, we'll spend all the money, though. <laughs> well, well, that's my point. It, it, Let's go ahead and commit. There's a payroll item in here, and I'll let Mr. Trayer speak to that. So um, we could we could apply whatever is remaining to the public safety payroll. Um, so if we don't, if we have spending at the end of the year, at the end of the term, um, we, are, we have the ability, and that's within the guidelines, to do that. I, and that will help our overall budget. Vice Mayor Roberts. I'm, I'm in agreement with, with, with Ms. Dole. Just let's do 100,000, move it in. So for a total of 300,000? For a total Correct. of 300,000. And, and that way, try to help out our nonprofits. And is there any... Uh, with the tiered approach. Look talking. into the tiered approach. So it's like 10, 15, 20 maybe? Or That'd 10, be fine. Something yes. Like a three-tiered approach? Um, how does the rest of the council feel? concerning the tiered approach. Councilwoman Darby? I'm fine with that. Okay. Council member Claffey? I'm fine with that. Vice Mayor Robertson? I'm, yes, good. Okay. Council member Holmes? I'm fine with that. Council member Dole? Yes. All right, Council member Mead? Yes, I'm fine with that. Okay. okay. I too am fine with that. So you have your uh, direction. I did have one more question um, that was asked of me during break was, would this come back before you for some other type of approval? And it's not necessary. I mean, we're, so administratively, we can get this done and get these grants out there. And I'm a little concerned. I was thinking further about that question about the timeline. Since as soon as we could come back is the middle of December. And we have to get these payments out very quickly. We're going to have a quick process because we're coming up on the holidays. There's going to be a lot going on. So I don't, I just wanted to put that out there. Um, Council member Darby had asked me that question. And so I wanted to address that before we mm -hmm. walked away. Um, there really isn't anything else for you to approve necessarily. So I don't know. And again, I'm worried about the timeline a little bit. So I just wanted to put that out there. Well, if I'm um, just receiving direction from us and you can move forward um, with simply the direction, uh, it would be my viewpoint that we do so. Um, would the rest of the council be in agreement, or would you like an official vote? No, I'm fine with I'm fine. it. Do what you got to do. Okay. Great. Yeah, you, said, um, you said the rest of it could go toward public funds, or, or, or I mean, public safety payroll. Public safety, public payroll. safety okay. payroll, because they're considered okay. substantially dedicated, so that right. offers us some flexibility. Right. So, yes, and the 50, 54, 53,000, or whatever, where was it? For, for furloughs, 57,500, that's been taken care of. Correct? Yes, sir. Okay. Right. That's for the public safety. Okay. Right. Uh, Mayor Oaks. Um, Council Member Holmes. Uh, Ms. Beauregard, uh, would uh, any of this um, would any of this money be available to the rescue squad? Uh, no. I have not received any requests from the rescue squad. Oh, okay. Um, presumably, but we haven't. I haven't seen anything. Directly. They would be considered a nonprofit. They would. Yes. yes, I think they would. So, so they, they could so file as a nonprofit. They could apply for this. Yes. Yeah. Because they're not under the city's umbrella. However, they could file they do their the non sure. Yeah. Yes. I'm not sure what they're saying. Okay. All right. Um, so the next part, so, okay. So it looks, sounds like we talked a lot about the budget already. <laughs> I'm not sure if there's anything on this sheet that you all would like to have talked about. Let me just point a few things out that we changed since the last time we discussed this. Um, one way we balanced this was we removed the $100,000 that we had included for HVAC improvements for city mm -hmm. facilities. And this is after discussion with the public works director and that proven air treatment technology is just not compatible with our current systems. We have really pretty old systems that mm -hmm. actually need complete replacement. 
once that occurs, we can start working on that in our capital improvement program. Mm -hmm. Then we can have the most up-to-date latest technology and airflow systems. We have the scrubbers that you've seen around City Hall. Um, so, but to put any significant um, infa infrastructure and resources into an old system is just not worth it. And it's much better to just go and replace the entire systems and um, re hopefully we'll be able to do that in our CIP. Um, through that process. Um, in the, under the new expense request under police vehicles, we are recommending purchase of two SUVs instead of four. So that's a 50, so I reduced that by 53,000. Um, we are not recommending the visitor center custom face coverings. That was a reduction of 21,935. And then I reduced by 15,000, the additional infrastructure for dine out in downtown, which includes removable bollards for Beverly Street, mm -hmm. and then um, any other type of needs for the downtown or the businesses in the, in the area to kind of get them through the winter. Mm -hmm. And so I've been in discussion with Mr. Beam about that. Um, but most of that is for the bollards that will be installed. Um, mm -hmm. You'll see downtown um, on the side, you know, when we, mostly because we, Close the street for other reasons as well for festivals and special events, and they'll look a lot nicer um, than than what is down there now. So yeah, I was that's, going to ask they they're going to be they'll more look nice. <laughs> yeah, they'll look appropriate very, for downtown. So that I was able to reduce that by fifteen thousand. Okay. Um, everything else stayed the same, um, and then I'll and then we'll increase the two hundred thousand to three hundred thousand, and we'll mostly take it out of the um, future anticipated expenses line. Yeah. Okay. All right. Any other questions? Happy to answer. Any other questions? Okay, hearing none, um, we will move on to uh, item E, uh, the engagement letter for approval of the engagement of McGuire Woods LLP to represent the city of Stanton in connection with seeking a new city attorney for the city of Stanton. Mr. Rosenberg. Um, Madam Mayor, this item was added to the agenda by uh, council when it approved the agendas earlier this evening um, and it's before council for consideration as to the engagement of the law firm to assist with the recruitment of a new city attorney. Okay, are there any um, comments concerning the engagement of McGuire Woods to seek um, a new attorney for the city of Stanton? Mayor Oaks, this is Councilwoman Mead. Councilwoman Mead. I just have a couple of comments, um, largely around the process by which we came to choose um, McGuire Woods. Um, Chapter 37 of Title 2.2 of the Virginia Code is the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, also known as FOIA. The FOIA laws were passed beginning at the federal level in the 60s after the administration of President Eisenhower fired several thousand federal employees accused of being communists. When asked by a member of the public to see the records associated with the dismissals, the administration refused to hand them over. FOIA plays an important role in keeping government transparent and accountable and has been used to expose a lot of government misconduct and waste. People who are subject to FOIA include members of public bodies like city councils and official committees of the council. FOIA defines when meetings are considered public meetings, which require minimum notice to the public so that they can attend. If three members of city council get together for lunch and discuss city business, that's an official meeting. If two members of a three-person committee, a quorum, get together to discuss the official business of that committee, it's a, public com it's a public meeting. In Stanton, our city has a designated FOIA officer. She assists with managing requests for information from the citizens. Since the 1st of July, our FOIA officer has seen a six-fold increase in Freedom of Information Act requests compared to the first six months of 2020. This is a measure of the public's current lack of trust and confidence in the actions of city leadership. 
I believe that at all times, members of the city council should spend more time complying with the Virginia Freedom of Information Act and less time trying to figure out how to get around it. I'm not gonna be in favor of hiring McGuire Woods. The process was not transparent. Answers to questions have been vague. No references, if they were, if they were uh, asked for, were shared with members of council and no other consultants were given any real consideration. So as I said, I will not support hiring McGuire Woods. Okay, that of course is your um, choice and your opinion, Councilwoman Mead. Um, are there any other comments concerning the matter? Uh, Mayor Oaks. Council Member Holmes. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm curious is once we actually have some candidates, uh, are, are they gonna be vetted by um, a, a committee from, from, the, from our council or is it gonna be among all seven of us? Because I know sometimes when you do the whittling down, you, you'll pick two or three members to, uh, to, uh, to go over the applications. As, and then they're presented to the whole group. Is that the way we're gonna do this? Um, that will be decided upon with, uh, if we end up um, seeking the services of McGuire Woods, as well as John Venn, our HR representative, uh, the best steps in which to um, whittle it down, as you said, um, in order to have a panel come before council um, will be discussed and determined at a later date. At this point in time, we're simply trying to um, vote on whether or not to approve McGuire Woods to be the legal uh, special counsel in this process. Uh, well, um, it looks like it's gonna pass. And so what I'm wondering is, is, is you know, would they be like uh, some bipartisan uh, uh, group of us, you know, so it wouldn't just be like, uh, the four of you that just got elected would not, would it be possible that one of us that have been on there be on there too? Uh, that's, well, that's what I'm saying. Council Member Holmes, there is no committee at this time. Um, no one on council is on a committee that can be determined at a uh, later date. Again, at this point, we're merely trying to um, vote on whether or not to seek the services, the legal services of McGuire Woods. But you do I, under, I, I understand that. I'm just trying to, uh, you know, um, uh, I just have some questions. Thank and, and, you. and it's understandable. And you bring up some good points that um, a committee um, would need to be explored. So thank you. All right. Any further comments or questions? Yes, this is Carolyn Dahl. Councilwoman Dahl. I'm opposed to this because the hourly rate for this uh, attorney who doesn't do this for his career, he, he has done one or two maybe, but we don't know because we've never been given the information, but he's $705 per hour. And without looking at any other and getting any other uh, bids or estimates or offers from any other company that actually companies that actually do this routinely. It is their business plan to do governmental executive searches. And, and I think this is not transparent. Uh, and I, I think we should, we're, we're wasting taxpayers dollars. Madam Mayor. Uh, Vice Mayor Robertson. <clears throat> Ms. Dull, we, we talked in work session and said that uh, Mr. Woods was putting a cap of $15,000 on it. He could go lower, he could go higher, but he, if he spent more than, let's say, $20,000, we still get the $15,000 bill. If he spent $12,000, we get a $12,000 bill. And our own city manager checked three different local or area uh, uh, headhunter agencies, and they came back at twenty-five to $30,000. So I know you keep on saying the figure of 705,000 or 700, and, I mean, $705 an hour or whatever it is, 
makes no difference. It could be fifteen thousand dollars an hour. It, but he said he put a cap on it at fifteen. So it makes no difference. You can say that figure all you want, but it still doesn't make any difference in the end because the cap is a cap. Uh, Vice Mayor uh, uh, Robertson. Yeah, yes, sir. Holmes. Yes, sir. Um, I don't think it's, it's the money is part of it, but it's also uh, experience recruiting this. I think that we're all a little nervous about because we've had Doug for so long. I mean, Mr. Uh, Gwynn for so long, and and you know he knows the city inside and out. And he knows he knows us, and he you know I mean he it's his specialty, you know, and, and I'm, I'm a little nervous because I, I, again, I think we should be getting a firm uh, because they don't, they don't know that Mr. Venn was going to do the, a lot of the paperwork and the legwork and they might be a lot cheaper. I just don't, I think we should explore that. Councilman Holmes, they're not going to be $15,000 cheaper um, because the average was going to be 30,000 and Councilwoman Dole, um, I'm following your lead when you hired, without an RFP, Nancy Bowman to do the search for the city manager. Um, we have McGuire Woods, which is an A-plus rated law firm that deals with municipalities and law schools, and they have um, served as special um, counsel for municipalities in search for legal counsel. And we also have John Venn, who will be um, participating hand in hand with the named attorney concerning the search? Um, Mayor Oaks, I'm sorry. Um, Council Member Holmes. Uh, well, we all agreed to hire uh, Miss Bowman. I think we all talked about it in a meeting, um, and uh, and we we I think we were pretty unanimous. Uh, I'm not sure about that, but okay. But uh, but anyway. All right. Uh, any further discussion? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Madam Mayor. Council Member Claffy. I move to authorize the engagement of Craig Wood of McGuire Woods LLP to represent the city of Stanton in connection with advice on hiring a new city attorney. To approve the engagement letter dated October 15, 2020, related to the same in the form provided to members of council, and to authorize the mayor to execute the engagement letter. We have a motion on the floor. Is there a second? Second. We have a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, Ms. Simmons, please call the roll. Mayor Oaks. Aye. Vice Mayor Robertson. Aye. Ms. Mead. No. Mr. Holmes. No. Mr. Claffey. Aye. Ms. Dahl. A transparent no. Ms. Darby. Aye. Motion carries. All right, thank you. That leads us to the uh, next item. But before we uh, go into that, I uh, once again wanted to recognize our school board representative, uh, Bob Boyle. Thank you for coming out here tonight. All right. And with that said, the next item is matters from the city manager. Mr. Rosenberg. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Before I present one item to council, let me uh, remind the public that the next uh, item on the agenda is matters from the public. Um, and those who wish to participate by telephone might like to call now to be placed in the queue. The number is 844-854. 2222 two, two, two. and when prompted enter the access code 619358-POUND. Uh, Madam Mayor, members of council, the one item I have to share with you tonight is, is to confirm as you may have seen in the media release uh, issued previously that we are moving forward with the extension of the dine out in downtown initiative um, it's being rebranded as the Shop and Dine Out in Downtown initiative, um, really, I think, in recognition of the approaching holiday season um, in order to um, even 
more fully engaged retail establishments uh, in the uh, downtown business district. And Cheryl Wagner, who is chairing the uh, business recovery and outreach working group, uh, continues to work very closely with Greg Beam of SDDA to ensure that we receive regular input from the restaurants and retailers um, and that we move forward with uh, successfully with the uh, continuation of that program. Thank you. Thank you. All right, so the next item is matters from the public. If you would like to address the council, please feel free. Uh, you can come up to the microphone, uh, state your name, your address. You have five minutes to speak. Um, please keep your comments directed towards the entire council as a whole rather than individual council members. Um, we will go ahead and um, allow our speaker <laughs> that's already up there. And then after um, you have had a chance to speak, we will then take callers through Zoom. And then we will once again take um, uh, the citizens in the audience. Thank you. I don't mean to. No, no, not at all. <laughs> just heard the announcement as I jumped up. Um, <laughs> You know, I, I'm here on behalf of uh, Stork Stanton Foundation and the R.R. Smith Center for History and Art. I think everyone received a letter from David Bottenfield from the R.R. Smith Center. I have some extra copies if you guys did not receive that letter. Um, and I'd like to say, you know, Stanton has a fantastic downtown. Um, we've talked about it numerous times tonight. We talked about the, the um, Greenways plan, which connect all these different parts of downtown Stanton. We talked about so I think with some bollards, whether they'd be nice and it'd be appropriate for downtown or whatever. I, I missed the exact uh, comment. So, um, and we just talked about the um, shop and dine downtown. Uh, so people are coming downtown stand, they're coming to Shakespeare Center, they're coming to our shops, they're coming to our restaurants, and we have a fantastic downtown. And kind of the jewel of downtown really is the county courthouse. Mm -hmm. And um, although it doesn't belong to Stanton, um, but it is really a jewel of downtown Stanton. It's an, it's an amazing building. Um, and so we are uh, both the um, trustees or the uh, directors of the R. Smith Center and the board of the Historic Stanton Foundation are excited that the county is coming up with plans for how to keep the courthouse downtown. Uh, you know, we spent, some of us spent a lot of time trying to keep the courthouse downtown. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's exciting. Um, this plan, however, is not good for Stanton and not good for Augusta County. There's a lot of reasons why it's not good for Augusta County. Um, you know, we could uh, talk more to them about that, but, you know, Mosley uses the biggest possible courtrooms when they figure out their sizes. Um, if the county has a building, a, a much builder, big, bigger building than I think they need, um, because of that, um, the uh, county is sort of uh, hemmed themselves in and they're designed by trying to have one secure entrance rather than trying to have a, a campus where they have multiple buildings like they do now. So there's lots of things the county can do, a lot of options the county can do. And a lot of, I think those things would be cheaper from the, for the county. But tonight I'm speaking to city council mm -hmm. and I wanna say that the courthouse downtown is great. It's a thing we wanna encourage, we wanna work with it. I think I, I, we at Historic Stanton, we at the R. Smith Center, I want the city council to work with the county to figure out a way to keep the courthouse, courthouse downtown, to keep those functions downtown for the businesses um, for and but for the historic value of that, because that's really what makes Stanton such an amazing place. These are buildings that go back to the 1840s. These are buildings that housed, um, you know, that were home to four Virginia Supreme Court justices, were home to um, uh, Alexander H. H. Stewart, who was a you know, the, uh, U.S. representative and Secretary of Interior. So this rich heritage in those buildings that surround the courthouse as well as the courthouse itself, um, and the plan involves tearing down these significant structures, but more important in some ways, it is gonna ask the city to make an exception to its historic preservation guidelines, which is what makes Stanton the tourist attraction, makes it the business attraction, makes it the living attraction for people across the state. I mean, Stanton is famous across the nation for what we've done. And we've torn down a lot of buildings in the history of Stanton. I don't have a timer, sorry, I'll go over it. Just give me an axe. Um, Last time I knocked that off, you fixed it. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you know, so, so we've torn down a lot of buildings in Stanton and that is to our detriment. 
Um, these are not just shops. These are important historical buildings. Mm -hmm. And so what I want to encourage you personally, what the, our Smith Center directors want to encourage you and Historic Stanton wants to encourage you is to uphold the city's guidelines for historic preservation. Because um, this is not the only option. This is not, if we do this, there's nothing else we can do. There are other options downtown. There's a hundred and, I mean, if you just look at the infill space that there is around the courthouse, there's 150,000 square feet, roughly, to build a three or four story buildings that are Stanton scale buildings in those infill spaces between the banks, you know, the parking lot that we tore down buildings from back in the, I think the 80s mm -hmm. um, right now. So those buildings are not all contiguous. You can't have just one secure entrance, but you, there's a lot of space that the county controls or could get access to for building a really nice, secure, adequate courthouse downtown. So my plea to you, this RR Smith Center plea to you and Historic Stanton's plea to you is to uphold the city's guidelines that make Stanton the beautiful town it is today. I thank you so much for your attention and for you know the conversations we've had as we go forward. Thanks so much. Thank you, Wayne. And with a second to two spare. seconds. Oh, awesome. Well, you have a timer. <laughs> okay, Mr. Rosenberg. Is the caller whose number ends in six six on the line? Hi there. Please state your name and address Hi. and address your comments to council. Be glad to. Madam Mayor and members of council, I'm Sharon Angle, 1516 Denison Avenue here in Stanton. And for those of you who don't know me, I hold an undergraduate degree in local and state government and a master's degree in urban and regional planning. I came to Stanton in 1978, working for the Central Shenandoah Planning District Commission, first as a circuit riding planner and then as executive director. I was hired by the city of Stanton in 1987 and served as the director of planning and inspection until I retired in 2016. I was honored to serve the city during what can be seen as Stanton's renaissance. And city councils during that time recognized the resources that our unique downtown holds, primarily that it, it has an intact historic downtown and this could serve as a means to provide increased financial viability for the city through increased tax revenue, private investment, sales taxes, meals and lodging taxes. Um, councils enhance the downtown by providing some direct funding to make public improvements to our downtown. These included uh, the building that is our city hall, uh, the building that was our city hall that became a judicial center and the construction of a new parking garage to support the creation of Shenandoah Shakespeare Center and Hotel 24 South. Uh, councils also did a big dig that created an appropriate streetscape on four blocks of Beverly Street and added all new infrastructure, including fiber optic cable and bearing overhead wires, brick sidewalks, granite curbs. It made a difference. Council also applied for and received new grants from both the federal and state government. And uh, we did additional streetscape projects, infrastructure, and also assistance to property owners to renovate their properties. And we created the Stanton Downtown Development Association. And finally, the Stanton City Council created a legislative framework that protected our downtown. It adopted comprehensive plans that lay the groundwork by supporting historic preservation in both downtown and surrounding historic residential neighborhoods. And then it followed this by adopting a historic preservation ordinance and, in, and also adopted guidelines. An issue that will come before you shortly is a proposal from Augusta County for a courthouse project that violates the tenets of both your comprehensive plan in your historic district ordinance. I urge you to carefully consider the legal framework the city has for land use decisions and reject the Augusta County's proposal to demolish a significant section of our downtown and build an inappropriate non-compliant structure that will tower over our downtown. 
the Augusta County Board of Supervisors, I must say, has always looked out for its own interests, not ours. And we need to be wary of wolves in sheep's clothing. But um, also remember all the work that councils and you guys have and will do to create our downtown gym and look out after our best interests and for the future financial viability of our city. Um, uh, thank you for listening to my comment, and uh, y'all have a good evening. Thank you. Thank you. All right, next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in zero two on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please state your name and address. Hello? Yes, please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Madam Mayor, members of council, I'm Darlene Schneck and I live at 1410 North Poulter Street, Department 204 in Stanton. I'm calling to oppose the latest courthouse proposal by Augusta County, which would result in the demolition of historic law buildings in the heart of our downtown. The design by Mosley Architects would place two five-story buildings against the 1901 courthouse, just paces from Beverly Street. These massive box-like buildings, almost as high as the Masonic building, will dominate our downtown skyline forever, and not in a good way. This plan would go against Stanton's preservation guidelines adopted 24 years ago and updated two years ago with public input. We don't have to lose these historic buildings. Several years ago, Fraser and Associates submitted a plan. It is smartly integrated and it provides the county with the functional and secure space they need without the destruction of historic buildings. Tourism brought in $51 million to Stanton in 2018, which funds our roads, our schools, and our public safety. It's our Historic Preservation Commission denies this plan. I am asking that City Council also oppose it for our residents' sake, for our visitors' sake, and for all who come after us. Our downtown is a cultural gem and an economic engine. Let's respect and preserve what makes it great. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 47 on the line? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, please state your name and address and address your comments to council. Sure, this is Gretchen Bishop. I'm at 220 Institute Street. I want to thank the council and the city manager's office for the recent updates on public participation for city council meetings. Since the pandemic, I have appreciated the opportunity to listen to council meetings from home and tonight to address the council by phone. My comment tonight is about the Augusta County Board of Supervisors application for a certificate of appropriateness on their design for adding to the courthouse. Their plan involves demolishing nine adjacent properties in order to construct a five-story structure surrounding the current courthouse on two sides. First, I recognize that the current Augusta Courthouse facilities are lacking. The Stanton City Council has acknowledged this as well. In June 2019, the Council adopted their three-year priorities to achieve the City's vision for 2030. One says that they will work with Augusta County to ensure adequate court facilities in downtown Stanton and to create a framework for meeting future needs. In working with Augusta County, the council must do what they can to develop a cooperative, good faith relationship. As city council member, members, you are called to act on behalf of the interests of our residents and our businesses. You also have a responsibility to be transparent to Stanton citizens Otherwise, we, the citizens, cannot have good faith in you. Tonight, 
I want to call your attention to two photographs that are located right there in City Hall. I encourage you to look at them when you leave the building. They are photos of the courthouse. As you leave the council chambers, walk down the hall to the Beverly Street exit of the building. One photo will be on the wall to your right. It shows a view of rooftops of downtown Stanton. I think it may have been taken from Sears Hill. The caption underneath the picture reads, Stanton's skyline of tourists, towers, and steeples remain as a legacy of her fascinating past. Among the rooftops, you will see the steeple of First Presbyterian Church, the main building of Mary Baldwin, and in the foreground, the dome steeple and Lady Justice sitting atop the courthouse. If you look to your left, you will see a photo of just the courthouse. It's a front view of the whole building. It's roof, white dome, and steeple set off by a clear blue sky. Now, in your mind's eye, add in a five-story brick structure smack up against the north and east sides of the building. If the courthouse is built as proposed, that skyline, picturing these photos on the walls of City Hall, will never be the same. The feel of our downtown and the Beverly Historic District, where the courthouse is located, will be forever changed, and you will be remembered for it. During the next few minutes, days, and weeks, you will hear many opinions about the courthouse. One will be from the Historic Preservation Commission, which will recommend approval or denial of the Certificate of Appropriateness. The commission will base its opinion on Stanton's own zoning code and the historic district guidelines. These guidelines were adopted 24 years ago and updated two years ago. This was done with public input through public process. I urge you to listen to and uphold the opinion of the Historic Preservation Commission. And then please work with each other, with the Historic Preservation Commission and with Augusta County to come up with a plan that we can all support. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 88 on the line? Yes, can you hear me? Yes, please state your name and address and address your comments to council. My name is Kelly Burdick. I live at 1001 Selma Boulevard. Um, I'm an employee of the American Gypsy Center and I'm calling to say thank you for the um, reallocation of CARES Act funding toward the not-for-profit community. Um, as you know, the pandemic has made all of us who depend on the ability for people to gather together has made it near impossible for us to do our work. And at Shakespeare, we have been doing everything we can to remain operational. This past Sunday, we closed uh, what we called our Safe Start season. We were one of a handful of theaters in the entire country that figured out a way to produce and working with Augusta Health and Dr. Allison Baracco, we closed our season on Sunday without a single case of COVID-19. Um, so we've been doing what we can to stay afloat and it's near impossible for us to meet the full need that we have financially with social distance seating. And so I wanted to thank you for meeting us where we are by providing support through CARES Act. Thank you. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in five seven on the line? Yes, this is Julie Anderson. Um, good evening, Madam Mayor and distinguished city council members. My name is Dreema Anderson and I reside at 100 Smithley Circle here in the city of Stanton. I was born and raised in Augusta County and have had the privilege of being a Stanton resident for 12 years. I currently work as a real estate agent specializing in historic properties in our picturesque historic district. In the last 73% of my sales, all have been to out-of-town buyers. Since January 1, 73% of my sales 
have been to out-of-town buyers. And when I asked these buyers who could live anywhere in the world why they've chosen to live in Stanton, the overwhelming answer is the charm of our historic buildings and our award-winning Main Street. As Stanton residents, we are blessed to have such a lovely setting in which to live and work, and we should never, ever take our surroundings for granted. The mistakes made 40 years ago when we wiped out entire blocks of our town are still talked about and mourned as terrible, short-sighted decisions. It is incomprehensible that you are even considering tearing down historic buildings in order to accommodate a grossly oversized courthouse that will forever scar our skyline. What could you possibly be thinking? I liken this issue before you to the recent fight over the pipeline that Dominion unsuccessfully tried to ram through our beautiful Augusta County. Just as that pipeline would have forever scarred our beautiful valley, this courthouse will forever scar the skyline of our town. This scar will be the legacy of you, our city council. I beg you to slow this process down and think through what is the right decision for Stanton. You were elected to serve the citizens of this fine town. I have not heard one citizen of Stanton say that tearing down historic buildings is a good idea. I do not know what constituency you are listening to. In closing, I beg you to thoughtfully consider your vote on this matter. Do all of the due diligence you possibly can. Listen to the historic Stanton Foundation. Attend the rally at the courthouse on Sunday. Create a public participation process that gives an opportunity for citizens' input at all phases for city and county residents. Read every letter and every email that is sent to you on this topic. Answer your phone and look us in the eye and hear what we're saying on this issue. Because once these buildings are bulldozed down, our town is changed forever. And your name will be forever associated with that decision. I beg you to reconsider this folly. Thank you. Thank you. The next caller? Is the caller whose number ends in 75 on the line? Is there a caller on the line? Go, go ahead and go on to the next. Is the caller whose number ends in 05 on the line? Yes. Please state your name and address and address your comments to council. This is Randolph Burton, and I live at 211 Hendron Avenue. Thank you, Madam Mayor and City Council members for listening to my comments. I just want to speak briefly about an item from the work session. The annual report for the library was on the agenda, and I would like to say that the library has done an outstanding job this year under very challenging circumstances. They really came through in initiating curbside service after the COVID shutdown, and they continued to support patrons with grab and go services, as well as basic operations now that they have reopened. In addition, they volunteered their services as a drop-off site for flood relief. Mm -hmm. The Stanton Public Library is an essential community resource, and we are really blessed to have such a capable library staff starting with a really exceptional director, Sarah Scrobus. Well, thank you to the library and thank you council for supporting our library. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 22 on the line? Yes, yes. 
My name is Suzanne Fisher. I live in Waverly Green in Stanton. And I was going to speak about against the courthouse proposal, um, which I think, judging from the renderings of it in the news in the news leader, is hideous and will completely destroy the um, silhouette of our town. Other speakers have had much more um, articulate things to say about it, so I agree with all of them. Once you tear something down, you can never get it back. I was also rather um, taken aback by reading the stories in the news leader about meetings between some, but not all, city, Stanton City Council members and Augusta County officials going back for several months. So I think there's a real lack of transparency in how this proposal came about and the timing of it. And I just want to ask the council members, whose interests do you represent? Do you represent Augusta County or real estate developers or the firms who will get the construction contracts? Or do you represent the citizens of Stanton? I hope you will listen to us. I also want to speak briefly about the Second Amendment sanctuary um, debacle. Every day in our country, we hear stories about threats to kidnap or kill public officials. Armed militias have taken over city government buildings. There are a lot of angry people threatening violence today in our streets. It's unthinkable to me why in this time of anger and division, you are choosing to have a hearing on the Second Amendment sanctuary, making Stanton the Second Amendment sanctuary, which violates state laws. You're clearly pandering to a certain group of people whose identity is connected to owning and displaying weapons of death. It's also irresponsible in the, in the middle of a pandemic to have a public meeting that you expect to draw a lot of people I will not be attending the meeting. Another reason, because it's above reasons, and also because I spoke last year at a council meeting when this issue came up. I spoke against the sanctuary idea. As I spoke, there were a lot of angry-looking men sitting in the rear rows of the chamber, glaring at me the entire time, and some guy was live-streaming the speakers on his phone. It was very intimidating and threatening. Um, those of you who want this meeting, I don't know why you want to bring chaos to our city. And you will not get a complete representation of people's opinions because people like me will not come to the meeting and will not speak up because we are intimidated. Thank you for listening to my comments. Thank you. Next caller. Is the caller whose number ends in 5-4 on the line? Hello, this is uh, Dane Hammond. Please state your address and address your comments to council. My name is Dane Hammond, 5 East Beverly Street, Johnson, Virginia. Virginia. Sorry to have a voice there. Um, I'm here to speak uh, in regard to the county building downtown um, i am a developer that has been on both sides of the fence i've built the tallest residential residential okay, structure in the central shenandoah valley i've built some of the largest department buildings uh shopping centers office complexes and i recently completed the development of downtown Stan. um we brought about 150 million dollars worth of development to the valley so I'm here to speak primarily on the behalf of a developer that recognizes property for what it's worth and why I come to an area and why I invest in an area. So from a developer standpoint, I came to San Virginia for what it is. You have the power to make this not happen. I moved the company has 12 employees to downtown Stanton for what it is. Um, now we're proposing not to do that. From a developer standpoint, I would not look at going to back to downtown Stanton. 
for the sole reason it's not what it is now. Um, these are my opinions. It's not an uh, emotional one. It's a pure financial decision. Um, you are you have the ability to take away the draw of developers like myself to invest in an area because it's unique. I've done developments in Lexington, Stanton, Harrisonburg, Loudoun County, Richmond, Virginia, Norfolk, Virginia, the Eastern Shore of Maryland. I go to areas because they have a unique draw to them. Stanton's going to lose that unique draw. Stanton's going to lose the attraction of developers like myself to invest in an area because it has something to offer. I adamantly oppose this. Um, not out of an emotional thing, but out of a pure financial decision. I was asked to speak on this, what your opinion is. I didn't have a desire to come talk to city council. Um, but then I thought about it. I'm like, yeah, no, I'm not coming back. To, I'm not going to put another development in what becomes just another town. Uh, what, draw, what drew me to Stanton, what made me move one of my companies down here and bring employees and invest a million and a half in one building on Beverly Street was because Stanton has something unique to offer. I'm afraid if you pass this, there's nothing unique to offer anymore. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next caller. We'll try this number again. Is the caller whose number ends in 75 on the line? Yes. My name is Jennifer Trapier. I live at 14 Frontier Ridge Court in Stanton. And I appreciate the opportunity to address council tonight. Uh, tonight I'd like to focus on the courthouse addition that's been proposed by the County Board of Supervisors. We live in a wonderful, unique city. I've resided in the Valley for 42 years now and a blessing has been to visit Stanton, and now I am a resident here. The courthouse and the subsequent demolition of the historic lawyers and barristers building for what seems to be um, unnecessary. Reviewers of our special city call Stanton an architectural jewel. It has been incumbent and decided in years past by city council to preserve its historic architectural heritage, specifically identifying our amazing downtown with its preserved red brick buildings as a draw to visit this city. Tourism is a major economic need for the sustainability of our city. So I am perplexed as to why we would be considering uh, altering what draws people here. The city is listed in many publications, online and in print, recognized for its historic downtown. To destroy this part of the city will be to destroy what comes uh, as an attraction here. Um, one of the items written was the city planners in Stanton were very careful to preserve the town's heritage, keeping power lines and cell towers out of view of the historic district, allowing nothing to interrupt the charm of local areas and shows op, excuse me, operating out of original historic storefronts. Then there is a beautiful and interesting downtown with many quirky shops and restaurants, the Woodrow Wilson Presidential Library and Museum, the Mary Baldwin Museum, the American Shakespeare Theater, the Stanton Foundation promotes the preservation and revitalization of Stanton's rich architectural resources, which escaped damage during the Civil War. 
further on, the article identifies local uh, economy is driven by tourism, retail, and the university dominate the economy. I hope that you, the city council, will heed the plans laid out in the past and preserve the integrity of our wonderful city. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next caller. Madam Mayor, presently, that's the last call. Okay. Uh, this opens it up to uh, the citizens out in the audience. Uh, would anyone care to address the council? Please feel free to come forward. Thank you. My name is Ted Lawhorn. My address is 1002 Baylor Street, Stanton. Uh, first off, I've got a different, a couple comments that most of everything that I've gone over that I've gone over in my mind has been addressed here. So I'm not going to go. There's no sense me standing here and telling you how beautiful downtown Stanton is. I've lived here my whole life. Y'all know it, and I know it. So, the, I, if you look at the uh, the computer rendering, uh, which I did. Uh, of the new courthouse proposal. Uh, it's To me, it's atrocious. Uh, and they're correct in that fact. I, I was an Augusta County resident for a while and I voted to keep the courthouse downtown Stanton because I was raised in Stanton. I got, Stanton is our home. It was the county seat. We came here for court. We came here to shop. We came here for all the parades. We, you know, the, it, it was a part of us. And I think the courthouse and it, all of that is a part. I also recognize that there's a substantial uh, financial and economical gain to having the courthouse here. And I understand that if you built a five-story building and you filled it with people who wanted to eat, that could be definitely considered a, a, an economic move. But uh, I think you also, in, in listening, watching your faces, you recognize the beauty of downtown Stanton and you recognize what it is. My suggestion would be to, first off, as, as everybody said, make this as transparent as possible, please. There's a, there's a, and I'll address that in just a minute, something else I want to do, but make it as transparent as possible. Come up with suggestions. Be amenable to Augusta County to say, here, you know, work with us. Let's see what we can work with, uh, with the property owners. Let's uh, see what we can do to help. Don't take a you know, don't take a uh, an adversarial position with them. But I would recommend also, just as said before, once these buildings are torn down, they can never come back. Stanton can take a vote and move everything out of here. They can do that. They can do that five years down the road. They can do that 10 years down the road. They can do that two years down the road. It's their land. They can move in and they can move out. But the effects of tearing down those buildings is forever. So I would, I would ask that you Consider uh, one of the things that uh, we're talking about, I'm gonna talk about in just a moment, are special meetings. Uh, and I would ask you, if you think you, that it would do well and that you think you're considering approving this five-story monstrosity, that at least you would have a public hearing on the matter before you do so. Uh, that would be my request and I'm sure the request of numerous, uh, the majority of that I would say of the Stanton residents. Another thing that I wanted to address is I, uh, I'm i a fond of going on the website and studying the agendas and, and the minutes of the meetings. I like to sit back and read that and I wanted to come to this meeting and I wanted to see the minutes of the last meeting. Now, I understand it's every two weeks and there's, you have to approve the minutes of the meeting. I'm familiar with meetings and everything else. But there should be some way that you could come up and with a procedure, uh, some change whereby the minutes of the past meeting could be approved and, and put on the website at least, say, five days prior to the next meeting. <laughs> because you have, you have people who want to come to a meeting about continuing right. issues like we're doing today, mm -hmm. continuing issues. And these continuing issues, if I want to come to a meeting, What's the first thing I want to know? What did they say the last time? Right. And to not have that, and you know, is I think a detriment to uh, it, to logical and and good arguments to the people. So I would like to ask for that. Another thing that I'd like to address also is the Second Amendment deal. Um, and I, I I've said this before, and I will say it again. I am a supporter of the Constitution. I'm a supporter of the Second Amendment. Mm -hmm. 
I don't know whether you're supposed to tell it or not. I've got guns. I've got concealed carry permit. I've got it all. I believe in the Second Amendment. I do not believe in sanctuary cities, whether they're in San Francisco. I do not believe Augusta County. I don't believe in saying you're a sanctuary anything. Mm -hmm. It is not in your power or the city council or the Augusta County, or it should not be in the uh, sheriff of Augusta County or anybody's power to interpret the constitution of the United States. That's the reason we're going through a big fight right now to get a Supreme Court justice. The justices decide the constitutionality. And I think it is a, it would be a detriment to the city of Stanton for city council to express in any way a, a difference or a special belief or a special- I'm sorry, your time is up. Regarding that amendment. So thank and, you. All right, thank you. Thank you. All right, would anyone else care to speak from the audience? My name is Baldwin Jennings, 332 Sharon Lane Stanton. I'm a lifetime resident of this city, except for about 20 years I put in the military. And I well remember at the end of World War II, they changed all the faces on the building stuff downtown. They went to glass, aluminum, uh, definitely changed the character of the downtown section. Also well remember, we put the parking garage in beside the Stonewall Jackson Hotel. That wiped out probably about 12, at least 12 historic buildings or, or more. And uh, uh, anyway, I think it, I, I think it was just about put the parking garage in. They came into urban renewal south here, south of, of us here and tore all that out. And that probably you know, about maybe 15 or 20 historic sites. The group parking garage built right below us here tore out at least uh, back in Montgomery Wards. Uh, there's an automobile dealership and a few other buildings there. But uh, the, the point I'm trying to make is uh, we got to support our county. I agree five story building is, too, is really too much, uh, but that can be negotiated down. I'm for the, the county, keep, keep the, the county seat here of Stanton is not only birthplace of Stanton, but five states are made up of this county. And our historic thing, I definitely agree with it, but we gotta keep the courthouse and we gotta give them the business to operate in here. The courthouse brings in a lot of money, this downtown. All the lawyers will, will move into, into this area. They wanna be in the area of the courthouse. And the traffic is, is will definitely support it. And we had tore down like Central Avenue between Central and uh, Augusta Street, that's that's been wiped out from uh, the banks on up through there. Uh, the, this building right here used to be Legacy Department Store, and before that was Reed's Grocery Store. And uh, um, there's lease uh, on Main Street alone. I right offhand, I can think of six brand new buildings that have been built from across the Trinity Church there on the corner for the. Central Methodist has its uh, office building there. It was Stanton Grocery, Singer Soul Machine, uh, one other business in there, Brass, uh, some type works. That's been wiped out. The, the whole, the, the bottom line is uh, we got to accept, uh, we got to work with the county. And I agree with you, five stories is too much, but I believe it, we can negotiate that down and still maintain the courthouse and the businesses in there and those and it's true those little office back in there i remember it used to be a restaurant down in that area which was a black restaurant by the way uh and uh, cleaners and a few other architect firm in there and plus a few lawyers office but uh this this we need the county we got to work with the county we got to support the county we got to keep standing the, the seat of augusta county and, we, and that way we got to work with them now across the street there i remember when that building was built, I think it opened up in 51. There's a chamber of commerce used to be across there. Uh, they had the uh, Gus County Jail was across there. It was uh, two or three, uh, two appliance stores or elect electronic stores in there. Plus the chamber of commerce. And I remember going in the building, the chamber of commerce says Stanton, Virginia, Queen City of the Shenandoah Valley. I hadn't heard of Queen City of the Shenandoah Valley for years. Uh, but uh, anyway, the bottom line is, let's work with the county and we can 
I'm sure we can change the architectural plans a little bit. You know, maybe knock them down to four stories, but but Stanton will always be a historic city and it will always be a place to come through in the valley because of the location, the interstates and everything. So we not give, we, we may be giving up a little bit, but we're gaining a lot too. So let's keep all that in mind. Support the county. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else care to speak? My name is Jesse Freitas. I live at 806 Ritchie Boulevard, and I'm going to surprise you because I'm talking about the courthouse. Um, <laughs> so uh, I had this whole thing planned out and I wrote it down. But the, the first thing I think I find really odd and kind of disconcerting about the first plan is that it came out with almost no other variable than let's wipe out as many historic buildings as possible. Mm -hmm. I'm a native of New Jersey, and so when I moved down here, um, I liked everything that everyone else has said about Stanton, but also we are very used to, um, and no offense to any New Jersey people, but we wipe everything out all the time, constantly. <laughs> and it's, it is to the detriment of people like me when I go home, because not only do I get lost really easily, but the other part, portion of it is half of everything is gone. So the character leaves, but the negotiation that whole time that your name will be on, that's permanent. And I think a lot of people have made that point. So I want you to consider that very very seriously because for me I, I deal with young people every day and when i tell them government's forever it's in record it's over someone's going to listen to my voice later and be like this guy's kind of weird but it's there it's on the record and that's what i think you guys need to consider when working with the county and negotiating um i'm also um i'm traveled for my age i guess and when i visited europe a lot of things that included there for infrastructure changes included two-in-one projects so you may want to consider some of the more adventurous projects that could be used just by using the city engineering department. If they can find a way to make an infrastructure over that parking area that's already been ceded to the banks that are now consolidating and leaving, you could do two in one, channelize all of that infrastructure underneath to fix the waterway problem and buy yourself some more space basically for free. And if you considered a more, even a more entrepreneurial approach and just negotiate with the county because I think they have they have the space and they have the time and you guys hear you hear us you hear all of the citizens saying what they need um the other portion I'm kind of worried about is um it's basically I guess procedural vocabulary so I'm I'm very much into using vocabulary every single day with young people and one of the things that I'm kind of concerned about is an, a misunderstanding of what transparency means and so for me transparency at any point uh should not be con confusing and it shouldn't feel like I'm confused looking at any minutes, anything online, or hearing something's happening when what I see in person is completely different. And I, my concern is that with a plan of this gravity, if transparency isn't the key, then how are you going to convince anybody to take the plan seriously? And so I want you to consider not only your effect on the literal plan, but I want you to consider some of the transparency motions as well. Um, and while you're deliberately planning and thinking all the way through, I want to make sure that we're respecting all citizens of Stanton specifically, because when we get to our two a hearing, I don't, I'm not really keen to hear their opinions of someone from out of state telling me how I'm going to live my life that I just started here in Stanton, Virginia. And so I know in past hearings and past events, we've had people come from everywhere. That's cute and all, but unless they live here, 24401, I don't necessarily think they should be deciding how I live it here. So I thank you all for giving me your time and take these into heart. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else care to speak? Good evening, City Council, Madam Chairman, Mayor, aka Beauty Queen, I uh, learned tonight. Uh, my name is Pam. Honorary. <laughs> okay. Uh, my name is Pam Robbins. I live at 210 North New Street in the Stanton Gym, the Miller House. Mm. And I sincerely believe that we are in a leadership crisis and a situation in which the very essence of what defines Stanton, its historic charm, is in jeopardy. Credible leaders are collaborative, 
They represent not just the interests of those who voted for them, but rather every member of the community they serve. They are guided by a moral compass. They make decisions based on careful study of data. Being data-driven should engage leaders and representative community members in analyzing a wide array of options against weighted criteria, vision, budget, taxpayer dollars, what attracts outside revenue to Stanton, visitor center input, historic Stanton, Frazier and Associates, and much more should all be considered and guide decisions. The current courthouse proposal, I guess I am repeating uh, ourselves here, threatens the demolition of several historic structures, each with a story to tell about its history. These structures stand amidst a backdrop of other viable possibilities. We just heard Jesse talk about one. Another might be the district court building that seemingly does not have distinguishing historical characteristics. Sound decisions are made by visionary, credible leaders in which community members place trust and should be grounded in feasibility studies supported by a representative sample of its citizenry. I urge you to be moved by the better angels of your nature and conduct a feasibility study guided by criteria that a wider array of Stanton citizens endorse. I thank you sincerely for your time and your service to our community. Thank, Thank you. you. Would anyone else care to address the council? Good evening. My name is Pam Dettelbach and I live at 145 North Poulter Street. I didn't know I'd be speaking today. I had no idea what to expect. I came with a sign with two items that I was very concerned about uh, that you said. Uh, my first concern was that you were going to be wasting time and having an extra meeting on a second amendment, trying to become a sanctuary city. And for me, the city of Stanton is a peace-loving, open-minded town, not some place that we should be concerned. We follow the United States Constitution and do not need to be um, a sanctuary for people that want to carry their guns. Uh, so that I even wore a flower in my hair for flower power for anybody that's as old as I am from the 60s. Um, so I didn't know if there'd be a room full of people or what to expect. So that's why I made the sign. Um, my second passion is the historic nature of our town. When we first visited many years ago, I was so tickled by the sign in front of the courthouse that shows a picture of how big the county was, and I'm from Ohio, and it even included Ohio all the way to Chicago, and I was like, oh my goodness, this is a place for me. And then I saw the pictures on the news leader, and I thought, it must have taken architects months, maybe even longer, of planning to draw up those plans and single out which buildings they were going to be demolishing, and for the plan to have gone so far, and this was the first we saw of it, I had to wear my transparent mask to remind you all of transparency because how could these plans have gotten so far with none of us even having an idea that uh, this kind of expansion was being considered. So please keep in mind the charm and character and really soul of Stanton in keeping these buildings. I love cutting down that little alleyway. I guess it's called Barrister's Row, mm -hmm. and thinking, I believe Thomas Jefferson even had an office in one of those buildings, or at least that's oh. a rumor mm -hmm. that Thomas Jefferson was even here at one point arguing a case. So anyway, those are my words. Please keep us all in mind. Don't tear down a building or nine or eight buildings just to do that horrible expansion. Thank you for your time. And Thank you. Spread peace and stand. Mm -hmm. Um, next speaker.
Good evening, Mayor Oaks and members of the City Council. My name is Ingrid Blanton and I am at 217 North Madison Street. Um, I am here to speak this evening about the um, memorandum that you issued in the last few days calling for the public hearing. Um, the memorandum simply states that it is pertaining to the Second Amendment. Now, I don't need to tell any of you that that is a vast subject. Um, and so that statement really tells us nothing about what the purpose of that hearing is. I did email all of you um, and did not receive a response because I asked very specifically what it is that you intend to accomplish with this hearing. I know a few members here have referenced um, a Second Amendment sanctuary um, discussion that was certainly not in your memo. But in, in a vacuum of any response from you all, I will say that I did see a statement um, on Facebook, which I know is not the most reliable source, but this is a statement made by um, groups with which you all have a very strong association. And that is the, um, the, Stan the, the Stanton Republican Committee and the, uh, I think Stanton Patriots is the, the other group. Um, but that is their Facebook page. And in it, they um, urge people to come to this hearing. And what is most disturbing is that at the end of that, they say, less than a week before the 11-3 election, this is our opportunity to show support for 2A, our president, our police, and for law and order. Ladies and gentlemen, that appears to be a very thinly veiled description of what is Trump rally held in these chambers. And I would urge you to clarify what that hearing is and to provide for all of us a response to my question. What is it that you intend to accomplish? And what is it that we are all coming to address when we come to that hearing? Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Hello. Hello. My name is Deborah Kushner and I live on North Augusta Street. COVID cases are climbing in Virginia. A new outbreak is occurring right now at King's Daughters Rehab, a facility with 117 beds. They report through 34 active COVID-19 cases. That's 29% of their capacity. These are stark figures. Consider what it's like at King's Daughters where this outbreak has every patient, staff person, family member and friend terrified at the implications, taking all possible precautions to contain this highly contagious, deadly disease. Consider how they view holding a large public event with large numbers of people expected, a listening session that wouldn't change law, a listening session that duplicates the ones held earlier this year, a listening session meant only to rally a very specific group that already has the ability to own and bear arms. Council could alternately educate citizens that there's no new legislation aimed at taking guns away. Condoning firearms in public places is so very dangerous, macho, and reprehensible. An unneeded pointless gun rally in the time of COVID. This is a new low for Stanton a very low, low. Consider the effect naming Stanton a sanctuary city will have on tourism. And by calling this hearing, you are putting lives at risk. And for what? Pointless bravado. A thoughtless presentation was made before this body in August by my brothers and sisters keeper. This is an organization poised to affect positive, lasting change in our community. Why have you been silent in response? Why do plexiglass dividers for golf carts get more attention than addressing racism's effects on individuals? So the community's health and welfare isn't on your agenda. Perhaps history or tourism? No. Preserving the integrity of the downtown that keeps visitors flowing in, even in a pandemic? No. 
You've made it clear you don't intend on listening to the Historic Preservation Commission's opinion about obliterating a significant portion of the historic downtown area. Tourists bring much needed revenue to our struggling businesses. So what is your agenda? Or more specifically, who is setting Stanton's agenda? You members of city council are entrusted with shepherding the city through a crisis, actually several crises. You should be leading and not avoiding. The example you set matters. Reneging on the American Shakespeare Center's transit hub site was done in a flash. The ASC has brought significant attention and revenue to the city. We truly need the ASC to keep Stanton a tourist destination. On the night of your vote, PBS aired a six minute feature on the ASC and Stanton. Did you see it? Did it make you proud? Citizens aren't being supported or even considered unless you're a golfer or a developer, that is. The Greenways plan is lovely, accessible, safe space and exercise for all, much more positive and much less exclusive than golfing. The Emerald Ash Borer plan is worthy to help curtail the spread of this pest. The library's annual report is a thing of beauty a true cornerstone of this town, rising to the occasion to serve in creative ways. I urge this council to contemplate why Stanton is the thriving, friendly community it is and what brings the disparate parts of it together. The projects you are choosing to focus on serve only to divide. Preserve this gem of a city. Don't sell it out. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else? Hello. My name is Rusty Ashby, I live in Stanton, Virginia. Mayor Oaks and members of the city council. Wow. <laughs> I was talking to somebody earlier and they talked about misinformation and apparently it really is flying. Um, I'm not, I don't have time to address it all. Don't assume so many things. Um, it's a process. They didn't ask for the county did for the county to take care of the courthouse, and I'm in favor of saving the courthouse. So don't misunderstand what I'm about to say. But when I was on the board of supervisors in the 1990s, this came up, and we tried to get something done because we were told the basement's going to flood. Thousands of historical documents are going to be gone. You've got to do something. Well, the, the county wants the city to be involved with it. I understand why I'm in the city now. I'm on their side. They can't just say, well, no, take, take that awful picture because it was all paid. We're not going to talk to you. <laughs> Stanton and Augusta County got to figure out a plan. What, what the gentleman said from the historical is exactly right. The people that are against this get off of their shoulders and get involved. Don't tell them how bad they are. These people love Stanton too. I don't know if part of it is from a recent newspaper ad or an editorial or actually, a, I guess, a publication. This gentleman uh, accused these four people of accepting election donations and they made a deal with the county. That is a lie. And if it was true, they'd have the, the legal people would already be involved and these people would be in big trouble. They have a city attorney, they've got a county attorney, what little bit these people are talking to the county because the county's trying to do something. Maybe it's not what should be done, but they did not accept money. These people love Stanton. If they didn't, they would not be doing what they're doing right now tonight. I've talked to every one of them. There's nobody here looking to tear those buildings down. I can assure you of that. But there's, there's, there's got to be uh, solutions to this. And, and get the elected people, the city and county had a hard time forever trying to come to conclusions. When I was on the board of supervisors, reversion was being discussed. Some of you might remember the city, uh, the Augusta County landfill was a big project. Mm -hmm. There were some supervisors who didn't want to share it in Winsboro. It would reduce the cost of Stan Winsboro tremendously. And there was one member on the board of supervisors, oh no, they're not going to do all that. They're not going to do all that. 
We didn't listen to him. We put that regional landfill together and it's saving Stanton and Augusta County and Waynesboro millions of dollars. But you got, if, when people are upset and they're blaming each other, it's not to be solved. Hearing on your idea something is to put a, a, together a subcommittee of people on both sides to come up with, a, I know it can be solved, but what people got to realize, something's got to be done. It's a courthouse with tens of thousands of historical documents. And if everybody keeps picking on these guys and blaming the county supervisors one day, those documents will be gone. Everybody's, oh my gosh, why don't we do something? It's been 20 some years, you know why? Because the two elected bodies can't come to an agreement. That's simple. Get people like him more involved and say, okay, let's forget about what you want to do and what I'll do. Something needs to be done. I mean, we, we put a man on the moon. We can solve this problem easy. But I want to make sure everybody hears me and goes in the minutes or whatever. These four people care. They have no intentions of doing this. And what really bothers me is some of those people want these four people to recuse themselves because they've talked to some county people. Well, if you don't talk, you can't solve solutions. Maybe somebody wants to say, well, they shouldn't have done that. They've got an attorney, the county does. If they shouldn't have done it, they would have been told not to do it or something would be going on right now and nothing is going on. It's just something to stir up the citizens of Augusta County and Stanton to once again, walk away from that courthouse. And I hope they give me a copy of these minutes so that I can pass it on to my son or grandson. And one day at that courthouse falls, look what granddad said. He said, you need to get together and fix this place and quit pointing fingers at each other and accusing people. If you spend all the time and other people spend all the time trying to come up with a solution, they'd probably be there. So uh, I can say a whole lot, but it looks like my time, time's about up. <laughs> so uh, God bless you all. Whatever you do, do not recuse yourselves. Thank you, Don't Rusty. do that. And I appreciate your remarks. Bullying, bullying has got to stop. Remember years ago, all the bullying? Well, there's bullying going on in this room right now. Stop it. Thank you very much. God bless you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak? Madam Mayor, we do have one more caller. Okay. All right. Go ahead. Is the caller whose number ends in zero zero on the line? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Please state your name and address and address your comments to council. It's Allison Pescada. I live on Farrier Court in Stanton. Um, I agree with what everyone said about the courthouse and downtown. So I wanted to actually use my time to lift up the voice of Jasmine Brooks, who spoke at the last meeting. I wish as many people who spoke tonight so passionately about buildings would speak just as passionately about the lives of marginalized folks, because their lived experiences are often vastly different than yours and ours. And I hope that council will get back to her if you haven't already, and also approve the My Brothers and Sisters Keeper Initiative and institute a Marcus Alert in Stanton. Thank you. Thank you. Is, is that it? That's it. Mr. Rosenberg? Yes. Okay. Um, as the residing officer of this meeting, I am going to make some closing comments. Uh, when I ran, I ran on five issues, three of those. Protect the charm of Stanton, listen to the people, and economic development. I will do everything in my power to preserve the charm of Stanton. I will also work to promote economic vitality in Stanton. The county courthouse needs to be renovated. It has to happen. Um, this needs to happen to help promote economic vitality in the health of our economic status here in the city. Now, with that said, I will listen to the citizens. I will push for a healthy economic status and development while maintaining the charm of Stanton. There has to be a balance. There has to be a balance. We do not want to lose the Augusta County Courthouse, but in the same token, we do not want to bulldoze our downtown in the process. There has to be a balance. 
these discussions have just begun between the two localities. This is going to be a process. And the two localities will need to have an ongoing conversation. And in the end, we want to be able to say we were able to reach a balance. We have that healthy economic status here in Stanton. We were able to maintain the charm of Stanton. And we will be able to say we did that because we listened to you, the citizens. And as mayor of the city of Stanton, I call this meeting adjourned. Thank you.